This comprehensive course guides you through crafting a robust e-commerce website similar to Amazon.com using Next.js 13.4 and its new app router. Master Next.js server actions, database intricacies with Prisma, seamless authentication via NextAuth and MongoDB, and create a stellar UI using Tailwind CSS and Daisy UI. Beyond building, you'll also dive into deploying your project on Vercel, optimizing metadata for each page, duplicating Prisma requests, and setting up essential tools like Prettier and ESLint for a streamlined development experience. Florian Walther created this course. He is an experienced developer and popular teacher. Hola muchachos. In this tutorial, we will build an amazing e-commerce website using Next.js 13 together with React Server Components and Server Actions, which are still in alpha right now. For the styling of our website, we will use Tailwind CSS together with a really nice component library called Daisy UI. We will store our data in MongoDB and to connect to our database, we will use the Prisma ORM, which works really nicely together with Next.js. And we will even implement authentication into our website so that a user can log in and for this we will use next off. So this is a full stack project where we build both the front end and the back end right in Next.js and we are really using the cutting edge technology right now in this tutorial. The latest of the latest, some of these features are still in alpha. So this tutorial will really equip you for the future if you want to be a Next.js developer. Okay, so without further ado, let's take a look at the project we will be building here. So our website is called Flomazon and it's a place where you can spend all your money. And as you can see on the front page, we see the list of products available on our e-commerce website. They are ordered in descending order with the newest product at the top and this is completely dynamic. So this featured product here at the top, which is displayed in this large box, is not hard-coded. If we added a new product to the database, the new product would be shown at the top and the pen would be shown here as the second product. But the featured product is only shown on the first page. So if we navigate to page 2, we don't have this featured product at the top anymore. So we implement pagination as well. The cool thing is the way Next.js renders and caches pages makes them open really fast. So if I click on a product, the page is there instantly. There is no loading time because this data is pre-rendered and then cached. We can of course add items to our cart and this is executed in a server action. Server actions are a Next.js feature that's still in alpha right now and they are basically a way to execute post requests on our server like adding an item to the cart as we just did without having to set up a separate endpoint. So this happens all directly in our components. Server actions are still in alpha right now and you will learn how they work throughout this tutorial. Let's add a few more items to our cart, maybe a banana and the Game Boy here. In the navbar we can see how many items we have in the cart and when we click on it we even see the subtotal, so the current total price for all items. We can navigate to the cart page where we see a list of all items in our cart. Here we can also change the quantity of each item, similar to how it works on Amazon. And again this is executed in a server action. And when we change the quantity of an item, of course the subtotal updates as well, our navbar updates and everything just works. Now the checkout button is just a dummy, it doesn't actually do anything when we click it. I know that many of you would like to see a tutorial with Stripe implementation, but I think Stripe should be covered in a separate tutorial to not make one tutorial too bloated with too many different topics. So if you want to see a Stripe tutorial by me, then leave a comment below. If there is enough interest, I might make one. And of course, leave a like on this video, because only this way I know that there's actually more interest in tutorials like this. But I haven't shown you the coolest feature of this project right now. So I really wanted to make the shopping cart professional. I wanted to have it work like in a real production website like Amazon. And every professional e-commerce website should have an anonymous shopping cart in my example. And I've implemented this. So if I sign out, I still have a shopping cart, which right now is empty because I'm not logged into my account anymore. But I can still add items to this anonymous shopping cart. So here comes the cool thing, when I now log into my account again, which we can do via Google login, but you can also add other authentication providers if you want. If I log into my account, which was this one here, 
It now merges the anonymous shopping cart with the shopping cart of this user account. So previously we had six items in our shopping cart in this account, but now we have seven. Why? Because it merged this mouse we added to the anonymous shopping cart into this authenticated shopping cart. And now when I log out again, the anonymous shopping cart is empty. So maybe let's repeat this one more time to really see that this works. So remember we had seven items in our cart. I add another item or let's add two to this anonymous shopping cart. So now when we log into our account, we should have nine items in there, right? So we log in again. It merges the shopping carts and there are our nine items. So this is really professional. Also, all these pages are server-side rendered, which doesn't only make them great for SEO, search engine optimization, but this also allows us to have all the data available when we open the web page. So if I refresh this page, you will notice that there is no moment where the shopping cart is emptier with zero items or not shown at all. Instead, when we refresh the page, we see the number nine here immediately when the page is opened. And this again, in my opinion, feels really professional because there is no glitch in the UI. And this is also how it looks on Amazon. When you refresh the page, there is no loading time for the shopping cart because we are not loading the shopping cart client side like in a classic React app. Instead, we load it server side. So the data is there as soon as the page is visible on the screen. We even implement a search functionality, which again is executed through server actions. So let's try this out. Maybe let's search for fun. Let's see what we find. We are searching in the title and in the description of the product. So somewhere in here is probably the word fun. Let's also search for pen. I know that we have at least one pen. There's our pen and somewhere in here is the word pen as well. But you can fine tune the search the way you want to only show exact matches, for example. That's up to you. And of course, our website is also responsive. So the grid here on the front page, for example, adapts to the screen size and shows a different amount of items. Everything moves around at the correct time. And even our pagination bar here at the bottom is responsive. So if the screen is too small, there will not be enough place to show 10 page numbers, for example. Instead, it changes to another kind of view, which looks like this. Now we have this right button that we can click and the current page number and also this left button. And again, this changes with the screen size. Really cool. The nav bar is, of course, responsive as well. So this moves below. And yeah, we will learn how to do this with Tailwind. Okay, so this is an amazing project we will be building here. And the focus or one of the main focuses of this tutorial is Next.js server actions because they haven't really been covered in any tutorial in detail so far because they are still in alpha right now. And we will use them extensively throughout this tutorial in different forms. We will use them from server components and from client components. So you will see how you can call them and work with them correctly. But there are some prerequisites for this tutorial because this is not a complete beginner tutorial. If you have never worked with Next.js before, then you should first watch my Next.js 13 beginner tutorial here on YouTube, which I will link in the top right corner of this video in the info card box. Because Next.js does some magic under the hood, especially when it comes to a caching pages. And you should understand this when building a Next.js project and I explain all of this in detail in the linked tutorial. All right, then I wish you a lot of fun with this tutorial and please don't forget to like this video. This is a signal to me that I should make more videos like this in the future. Have fun. Now it's time to set up our project and not only will we set up a Next.js project, we will also add some extensions that make it pleasant to work with. One such extension is Prettier, which is a code formatting tool, which is especially useful together with Tailwind CSS because there's a Tailwind plugin that helps you order your classes properly. Otherwise working with Tailwind classes can get really messy really quickly, so we will learn how to set this up properly. I will show you how to set up all of this manually, but I will also put a link in the video description below to the starting code that you can download from GitHub. The reason is that of course these different packages that we use get updates over time and sometimes these updates break existing features. And to make sure that you can still watch and follow this tutorial one year or two years in the future, you can download the starting code from GitHub where all the packages and all the configuration is already set up. So it's up to you if you want to create the project manually or download the starting code. Just know that if you watch this tutorial in the future and you do it manually, then you might have to fix some code throughout this project. 
project. Alright, to create a Next.js project manually, we open the folder where we want to put it. And then we have to open the command line here. On Windows, we can do this by holding shift down, right clicking inside this folder and click on open PowerShell window here. This might say open ZMD or command line here. This is also fine. We just need a command line window. If you are on Mac or Linux, then uh, yeah, open the command line there as well and navigate to the folder where you want to initialize the project. Again, you can skip this whole part if you downloaded the starting code from GitHub. Then you don't have to set up a new project. Just clone the repository into the folder where you want to put it. If you worked with React or Next.js before, then you already have Node installed. But just to make sure we can check it, we can type in Node minus minus version and it should show a number here. And it should also show a number if we type in npm minus minus version, which is the Node package manager that we use to install packages. Then, as usual, the easiest way to set up a new Next.js project is to use the create next app command, which looks like this. We write npx, not npm, but npx, and then create minus next minus app, and then add latest. And then we run this. We confirm this here with yes, with a y, and then we have to answer some questions. We have to give our project a name. I'm gonna call this Next.js e-commerce. Enter. Would you like to use TypeScript with this project? Yes, we always use TypeScript. Would you like ESLint? ESLint helps us find problems in our code and you always wanna use this as well. So again, we select yes. Would you like to use Tailwind CSS with this project? We select yes here as well, which is really cool because this way we don't have to uh, configure Tailwind CSS ourselves. It's already set up. Would you like to use the SRZ directory? This is just for organization. I prefer this, so I select yes here as well. Use the app router, recommended yes. This way we use the new Next.js 13 app router instead of the old pages directory. Again, if you have never worked with the app router before, you can follow my Next.js beginner tutorial where we use the app router. So we select yes here as well. And this is really important because otherwise the project structure will be completely different. So make sure to select yes. Would you like to customize the default import alias? No. And then we have answered all questions. We have to wait a few seconds and this sets up a new Next.js project. Okay, when this has finished, we can close the command line and now we should see our new project here. Next.js e-commerce. We want to open this in VS code. So I right click open in code. If you don't have this option here, then you can also just open VS code manually and drag and drop the folder in there or open it over the menu. You will know how to open a project. I would assume. And if you downloaded the starting project, then open the starting project instead. As usual, this gives us a project with a lot of configuration already set up. And we can open the command line, which you can do over viewer, terminal, or use the shortcut next to it. And then we run this project in development mode with npm run dev. We type this into the terminal down here which starts this project on localhost 3000. So now we can open a browser window, navigate to localhost 3000, and we should see this default template here. But this is not so interesting for us right now, so we can close this again. And we also stop the execution of our npm run dev by pressing Ctrl Z while our cursor is in the terminal down here. And then we confirm this with Y because now we want to install some packages. Again, this is only necessary if you have not downloaded the starting code, because in the starting code, I already installed all the packages to make sure that you have the same version number as me in the future. So you can skip this part if you downloaded the starting code from GitHub. All right, and we need quite a few packages in this project, and we will install them all at once. Now at the beginning with npmi, which is short for install, and then we type in a few different packages and you have to make sure that you spell all of them correctly because otherwise it will not install the correct one. Okay, so Tailwind CSS is already set up. We should actually see the dependency here in the package.json file because we selected Tailwind CSS when we run the create next app command. So this is already installed, TypeScript as well and some other configuration. So the first package we install here is Daisy UI. In our lower case like this, which is a component library for Tailwind CSS, I will show you how this looks in a moment. 
The second dependency is Prisma. And between each of these packages, we add a space. The next one is add Prisma slash client space. The next one is next minus off space. Then we have add off slash Prisma minus adapter space prettier space and we are almost done eslint minus config minus prettier space and one more prettier minus plug in minus tail wind css so you can pause the video and type this out by hand if you haven't downloaded the starting code and then we install all of them by pressing enter which will take a while and where did I get all these install commands from? Well, from the documentation of each of these packages. They will tell you exactly what you have to install, but I prepared all of this for you already, so you can just follow my instructions. And now all these dependencies are added here to the dependencies block in the package.json. Now, in case you're wondering, why do we install all of them in the dependencies and not in dev dependencies? Because some things like ESLint or TypeScript are only used in development. So usually we install them in dev dependencies so that we don't bloat our project in production. But in Next.js, this is actually not necessary. You can install everything in dependencies because the packages that we don't use in production will automatically be stripped away when we build the project. So there's no reason to use the dev dependencies block. Okay, and then I said that we also want to install some extensions that make working with our project more comfortable. Again, all of the setup is explained in the documentation of each of these packages, but I uh, prepared all of this for you already, so you just have to follow my instructions. So this is how you normally set up Tailwind CSS in a project. You have to install some stuff and you have to add some configuration files, but this is already done for us when we use the create next app command. It already takes care of all of this. For example, you can see these directives here. We can actually look into our project and they are set up in the globals.css file up here. But we still have to improve our editor setup, which you can find here under editor setup in the Tailwind documentation. Here they recommend that we install this IntelliSense extension, which we will do, and also that we set up Tailwind with Predator, which is this code formatting package that we installed. We will do both of this. Again, most of this is already done in the starting code on GitHub, but you still have to install the extensions. So you should still follow my instructions even if you downloaded the starting code. So back into our project. We go to the extensions tab, which is this button here and we search for Tailwind and then we want this one here, the official Tailwind CSS IntelliSense plugin, we install this and this gives us all the completion for Tailwind classes which is very useful, working without this is really, really almost impossible in my opinion, so we need this extension and they also recommend some configuration down here which we will do as well so they recommend this file association setting and to change the editor quick suggestions. So let's go into the settings, which we find under file, preferences, and then here settings. In the settings search up here, we type in files association. We don't have to type it out completely. We just want to find this setting here. Here we click on add item and we type in a star dot CSS. And for the value, we type in Tailwind CSS, a lowercase like this. Okay. And this way, Tailwind syntax works in CSS files. So now when we open global CSS again, these squiggly lines up here are gone. If you remember, there were squiggly lines under these lines up here. But not anymore with the setting. And we want to change another setting as well, which is really useful. We search for editor, quick suggestions. And they are off for strings by default. We want to change this to on. Because this way we get auto completion inside strings. And Tailwind CSS classes are strings. And we want auto completion for them to pop up automatically. So we change this to on. And these steps you have to do even if you downloaded the starting code from GitHub. Because I can't change your IDE settings for you. You have to do this yourself. Then we also need a little bit of configuration for DAISY UI, which is this component library that we installed earlier. 
We already did this step up here when we installed the dependency, but we have to add something to the tailwind config file. So we go back into our project and open the tailwind config.js file. And then we go into this plugins array here. And then we want to enter this part here, require daisy UI. You can type this out by hand. We can also delete this whole theme block here because this sets this background image that we don't need anymore. We will set our own background color later. And then I want to configure the daisy UI theme. So again, daisy UI is a component library. So we have different components here that are already styled, like buttons, for example, in different colors, modal dialogues that we can use, all kinds of stuff so that we don't have to set up all of this ourselves, progress bars, whatever. And this comes with a custom theme, but we can configure this theme. Up here is actually a really cool theme generator. You can find this under daisyui.com. The docs tell you how you can customize the theme and they also have this random generator, which is really cool. So this lets you generate a random theme and you can just copy paste this into your Tailwind config file. So if you want, you can generate your own theme on daisyui.com. You can also keep the default theme. I have prepared a theme, which I put in the Tailwind config file. Again, this is already added to the starting code. I'm gonna copy paste this in here I will also add a link to this file under the video so you can copy paste it from there. Again, you can skip this step or you can generate your own theme if you want, but this is the theme I will use. It sets different colors like the primary color, accent color, background color and so on. And I also set a background color in here in this body block. This is not mentioned here in the docs because this is not part of the default theme. But this way we can change the background color. We could also do this in the global CSS file. The benefit of doing this here inside the theme is that we could later create a different theme, like a dark theme, for example, with a different background color, instead of hard coding this into our globals.css file. Again, you can copy paste this from the link under the video if you're not using the starting code. Okay, we save the changes to this file. Then we go into the globals.css file. And here we want to delete everything except for these three Tailwind lines here at the top. They are necessary for the Tailwind configuration and the classes that we can use in our code, but we already set up our own background color, so we don't need this. And we also don't need any of these CSS variables here. So we delete this and save this file. Next, we want to configure Prettier for Tailwind CSS. So we have this automatic class ordering I was talking about. This is also very useful. We already have Prettier installed and we also installed this Prettier plugin Tailwind CSS earlier when we installed all the packages, but we have to add a little bit of configuration as mentioned here. So back into our project, we want to open our explorer here. So we click on this icon and here in the root folder, we create a new file with this exact name, prettier.config.js. And in here we insert this. You can pause the video and type this out by hand or copy paste it from the GitHub link in the description. I know setting up all of these tools is a bit tedious, but it really makes it easier to work with our project later. Prettier also has an extension that we should install. Otherwise we can only execute it over the terminal, but it's much more convenient to execute this with a shortcut, with a keyboard shortcut. So in the extension search, we type in Prettier and we want to install this extension here. Click on install. Then we want to make this the default formatter so that when we click the formatting shortcut on our keyboard, it uses Prettier instead of another formatter. So again, we open the settings over file preferences settings and we search for default formatter and we want to change this from none to Prettier, which should be somewhere in this list, you probably already saw it yeah, right here. So now we can use the formatting shortcut, which is Alt Shift F on Windows by default to use Prettier to format our files. And I just did this. And as you can see, it changed the indentation because Prettier is a very opinionated formatter. They don't give us a lot of customization options. Instead, they have a lot of rules that will automatically be applied when we use Prettier to format a file like using two spaces for intendation, for example. 
Brilia is very useful because it also automatically adds semicolons in the correct places, it adds line breaks when necessary, it's really much better than the default formatter. And we are almost done with our configuration, but we still have to set up Prettier to work properly together with ESLint, otherwise they can conflict, again this is described in the Next.js documentation. We already installed ESLint config Prettier earlier. Now we have to go into this ESLint RZ JSON file and make a little change there. So we search for ESLint RZ JSON. What we do is we turn this value here into an array by surrounding this with scrap brackets and we add a second string in here which just says prettier. We save this and this little change makes sure that ESLint and prettier don't conflict with each other. There are two more extensions that I want to install that are very useful. For one ESLint has an extension, I already installed this one. I recommend that you install this as well because this way we see our ESLint warnings directly in our code editor and we don't have to execute a terminal command all the time. And one more, Prisma, which is the ORM that we will use with our MongoDB database also has an extension. This one is also incredibly useful because later when we set up our schema file we get syntax highlighting there, we get auto completion and this also helps us format this file properly. So I recommend that you install this as well. That's it for all the configuration and extensions we have to set up. I just want to install one more package that I forgot earlier. So again we open the terminal and type in npmi sort cod. Again I will put this one in the styling code as well. This is just another package that we will need later. So make sure to install this and it should be added to the package.json down here. Okay, we can close all of these tabs here. All the packages and extensions are installed and configured. I also set up a few images for this project. Again, I added them to the starting code. But if you set up the project manually, I will also link these images in the description under the video so you can download them from there. I added these images to this project. For one, I replaced the FAF icon here. I used this logo instead of the default FAF icon. I also downloaded this open graph minus image into the app folder. This is the social media preview image, which will be shown when we copy paste a link to our website on social media, on Twitter or Facebook, for example. This file needs this exact name and it has to be added right in the app folder. Again, you can download it and put it in there if you're not using the starting code. And two more images that we will use throughout this project are inside this assets folder. So you can create a new folder inside the app folder here, call it assets and put these two images in there. For one it's the logo we will use for this website and then this profile pic placeholder in the case a user is logged in but they don't have a profile picture. Okay, again, I will take the project as it is right now. I will push it to GitHub. I will call this branch starting code or starting point and I will link it under the video description so you can download this whole thing without having to set it up manually. But it's still useful to know how to set up all of this yourself manually. All right, and in the next section, we will set up our MongoDB database and then we can start coding. All right, next we want to set up our MongoDB database and the easiest way to do this is to use MongoDB Atlas, which is a cloud hosting service for MongoDB. And they also have a free tier available that we can use to build our project. So you can search for MongoDB Atlas on Google and then just click on the link you find here. We have to create an account and log in. You can click here on start free. The website probably looks a bit different in the future. Just create a free account, log into this account I already have an account and here I want to set up a new project. I already have a project, but that's from my Next.js course. I create a new project here. Again, the UI might look a bit different on your side. Just find a button that says create a new project. Then we give this project a name. Again, I'm going to call this Next.js e-commerce. You can give this any name you want. We click on next. Yeah, this is already set up automatically. Then we click on create project and we have to wait a moment. And then we want to create a database in this new project. Here we can select M0, which is the free tier, but this is more than enough to build a little practice project. You can even use this for small production websites, by the way. We can select where our database is stored and in what region. We can keep the default settings here. You can change the name of this cluster, but you can also keep it as cluster zero. 
we don't have to change anything else and we click on create. And now we have to select mountains or hills. Okay, this is a hill, this is a hill. I don't know if this right here is a hill. Let's see. <laughs> yeah, we are, we are a human. Then we have to set up a username and a password to later log into our database. I want to set the username to Florian. I keep the password here and we click on create user. Then we have to add the IP address from where we want to connect to this database. In development, we are connecting from our local machine, from our computer, right? So we have to add our current IP address with this button, but this is already done down here. And we have set up a user and everything. Then we can click on finish and close and then on go to a databases. And now we have a hosted MongoDB database. I like MongoDB Atlas because they take care of a lot of stuff for you that you otherwise have to configure yourself. Like for example, replica sets, which as far as I know are additional servers that contain the exact same data as your database, just in different locations, in case one of them goes down. At least this is how I understand it, but this is already set up in MongoDB Atlas by default. Okay, and now what I want to do is I want to go to our collections, which we can do over this button. You can also click on data services here. And of course, we don't have any data in our database yet, but I want to add some data manually. I want to add some products here to work with. And later we will add a page to our website where we can add products over a form. But for now, we add them manually. We have to give the database a name. I'm going to call it uh, e-commerce. We want to create a collection called products. And we don't want to change any of these additional preferences. We click on create. And now we have this products collection here. And here we want to add one product, which we can do over insert document. Okay, and for now we will just use some dummy data, but the names of the fields are important because we will create our Prisma schema from the document we create here. So we have to decide what fields we want to have in a product document. We want each product to have a name, right? Just gonna call this product name. Again, this is just dummy data for now. Then we add another field. This one will be the description. Product description. Each product will have an image URL, which I spell in camel case like this. And for now I just write HTTPS colon slash slash um, product minus image dot com, whatever. This is the URL. And this is just a placeholder for now, doesn't matter. Then we add a field for the price. And all of these fields are strings by default, but we want to change the price to an int 32. So this is a number. And again, we put the placeholder in here, 999, doesn't matter. But we store the price as an integer, not as a float, even though a price can have decimals for cents. But you can't store prices as floats because floats are not exact. If you want to know why floats are not exact, you can Google this, but you should store prices in cents. This way we always have the exact number. So this is why we don't select double or decimal here, but a normal int. Okay, and we insert this dummy product into our database. And now it's here in our products collection. And as I already mentioned, we use Prisma to work with our MongoDB database. This is a library that we can use in Next.js or also in Node.js. And this just makes it easier to work with our database because it gives us a nice client on which we call these different functions for the different database operations. It gives us types and everything. And Prisma is a very popular one, especially for Next.js. Again, the installation and setup for Prisma is described in the Prisma documentation, but I will show you each step in this video. So we go back into our project and we already installed the package for Prisma. Now we open the command line again and we execute npx, again not npm, but npx, Prisma init. Spell it out exactly like this. We execute this. And this does two things. For one, it created this .env file with the database URL key inside it. But this is not the correct connection string. As you can see, this is just a placeholder. 
we get the correct connection string out of our Atlas backend here. Somewhere here is a button that says connect. I think we see it when we click on data services. Here's the connect button. And here on drivers, we can find this connection string. We can ignore these other instructions because we don't use the native MongoDB driver. We use Prisma to work with our database. But we need this part here. So we copy this into our project and we replace this part here in the string. Then we also have to replace this part here with the angle brackets for the actual password. So we paste this in here. And we also have to insert the database name here after the slash. This is the name we gave our MongoDB database. So let's see here. I think I call this just e-commerce, right? You can see this in the collections here. This is the name we care about. We enter this same name here after the slash. Otherwise, this creates a newer database, but we want to use the database that we already set up. Then we can delete these comments up here. They are a bit confusing and unnecessary. And then we also want to add this .n file to the git ignore so that we don't push our database credentials to GitHub. So we open the .git ignore, can scroll all the way to the bottom and add .n here. And now this is grayed out, which indicates that this file is not pushed to GitHub. Now, normally in the Next.js project, you put your credentials into these .env.local files and project configuration goes into the .env file. The problem is Prisma by default doesn't look into this env.local file, it looks into the normal env file. So the easiest way to handle this is to just put our credentials directly into .env. This is the same what we also do in a normal Node.js project, because otherwise we have to add additional packages and configuration to make Prisma look into this .local file. But I don't want to do this here. And it's also not necessary because putting credentials into the normal .env file is totally fine. You just have to make sure that you put it into the git ignore file so you don't push it to GitHub. Okay, and the second thing that the prisma init command that we executed earlier did is it created this prisma folder here with this schema.prisma file inside it. Here we want to change the provider inside data source DB, not up here in the client, but down here from Postgres SQL to MongoDB because we are using a MongoDB database and you can also use Prisma with SQL databases. And this is the part here that makes Prisma look in the end file for this database URL key that contains the connection string. So the spelling of this variable has to be the same as whatever is entered in here. And as you can see, we also have syntax highlighting in here, just like a normal TypeScript code, for example. But this only works because we installed the Prisma extension earlier. This gives us syntax highlighting, auto-completion, formatting, and so on. Otherwise, VS Code would handle this like a plain text file. Okay, and here's a very cool thing we can do. We already added the dummy product to our database, right? And we added the name of the database to the connection string e-commerce. Now we can tell Prisma to pull the data that we added to our collection and generate a schema from this data. So we don't have to set this up ourselves. So remember, we have a name description, image URL, which are all strings, and this price, which is a number. Now in the command line, we can type npx prisma db pull. This is the exact command. We execute this. This shows an error because I haven't saved the changes to the schema.prisma file yet. So we save this file and execute this again. Now it should work. It opens this window here because we have to allow this to execute on Windows. So yeah, just click on allow access and you won't have to do this again in the future. Here it says introspected one model and wrote it to a schema.prisma. And as you can see, now we have our products model here with the name, description, image, URL, and price, the correct types, and the idea is set up as a MongoDB object idea. This is called introspection. This way you can infer the Prisma schema from the data you already have in the database. But you can also do it the other way around. You can also make changes to the schema and push these changes to MongoDB. And we actually want to do this now because I want to add some more stuff in here that we can't really generate through introspection. We want to add this created at timestamp, which will be of 
type datetime and again we get auto completion because we installed the prisma extension and then afterwards we write dot add default and in here we pass now which is a function this means when we create a new product it will automatically set the created timestamp to the correct time and then we also add an updated add timestamp which again is date time and here we add this updated add annotation which takes care that this timestamp is automatically updated when we modify a product and now with the formatting keyboard shortcut which on windows is shift alt f we can format this file but they want us to configure a default formatter let's see yeah here we select prisma which is the prisma extension and now it formats this file properly I don't know what the keyboard shortcut to format is on Linux and Mac, but you can Google this if you don't know it. There's one more thing I want to do. So our collection is called products, right? This is the same name our collection has here. And you usually call this the plural of the word because this contains multiple products. But when we work with our data in our app, we want the operations to be called on dot product and not dot products. For example, I want to call product.create or product.find and not products.create because the plural is a bit misleading. And I also want the model name to be capitalized. So we change the model name to a product, singular. But now we have to tell Prisma to what collection this is connected, right? Because this collection is called products. The name is different. We can do this by going down here below the last field. And then we write two ads, map. And here we can add the name of the collection, lowercase products and plural. Now this model is connected to this collection and this way the model and the collection can have different names. And now instead of pulling the changes from the database into the schema, we want to push the changes from the schema into the database. So instead of db pull, we execute npx prisma db push so that these changes will be applied to our MongoDB database. Let's execute this. Okay, it says that the database is already in sync. So it seems like the changes we made in our schema doesn't require any changes in Atlas, but it also doesn't hurt to execute this. Throughout this tutorial, we will make some more changes to our schema here. So this is not the last time we modify this. And we want to execute one more command, npx prisma generate make sure to spell it correctly and then we run this this generates the prisma client which you can use to call our different database operations on and whenever you make changes to your schema like we change the name of the model here then you have to regenerate this prisma client so that you can use this new model in your code and you get auto completion and everything but again we will do this a few more times throughout this tutorial so you will understand when you have to do this Next, we need to initialize this Prisma client, like it is shown down here, by calling the Prisma client constructor. And we want to make this Prisma client reusable throughout our app. So we put this into a separate file. For this, we go into the SRZ folder here, where all our project source code is in. In here, we create a new folder called lib. Lib is just a naming convention for a folder where people usually put like utility functions, for example, or functions that use other packages like Prisma in our case. But it's up to you what folder structure you follow. In lib, I want to put another folder called db, just for organization. db obviously stands for database. And in here we put a file which we call prisma.ts. This is a TypeScript file. To use Prisma in development mode in Next.js, we need a little bit of special configuration, which is described in the Prisma documentation. Because when we save a project, the app is restarted, right? And we don't want to set up a new Prisma client every time this happens. So we use the code that is described down here. This sets up a new Prisma client and adds it to this global this object which is just a way to make this client globally available as a singleton throughout our app. And only if the Prisma client doesn't exist on this global this object, then we instantiate a new one. And this is only executed in development. In production, this is not necessary. So back into our project. I paste the code we just saw. You can pause the video and type this out by hand or again copy it from the GitHub repository. 
And then I press the shortcut again to format this file. You don't have to do this, but the cool thing is that since we have Prettier installed, it automatically adds semicolons, for example, and it also replaces the single quotes for double quotes because, again, Prettier is an opinionated code formatter, so they make some decisions for you, like not using single quotes, for example. But again, if you use this or not, it's up to you. I recommend that you use it. And now we are ready to use Prisma in our project and our database is already set up. So now the fun part can begin. Now we write actual code. Just one more thing. I want to delete our dummy product here. We only needed this for introspection, but we will later add actual products through our app. So let's delete this document. And in the next section, we will add our first page to our website, a page where we can add a newer product. And for this, we will use Next.js server actions. So this will be really interesting. Okay, so back in our project, we open the terminal again, and we want to start this project in development mode with npm run dev. Then we open localhost 3000 to see our website. And I put this in split screen so that we can make changes to our website and see these changes live. I want to add a new page to our website over which we can add a newer product. Because without products, we don't have anything to display, right? So we open the sidebar here. And then in the app folder, we create a new folder called add minus product. And in here, we put a file page.tsx. This way we can create a page under localhost 3000 slash add minus product. If you don't know how routing works in the Next.js 13 app router, then I highly recommend that you watch my Next.js 13 beginner tutorial first, because there I explain all of this. Why we have to create a page.tsx file, how we can create nested subroutes and so on. In this tutorial here, I will assume that you already know this stuff. Okay, and in here we can write the code for this component, for this page. So we export a default function and we call it add product page. As usual, the name of this component does not matter. The only thing that matters is that we export this from a page.tsx file. And from this component, we want to return some UI, right? So let's put a div in here. And let's put an h1 in here, a headline that says add product. Let's save this. And now we should be able to navigate to a localhost 3000 slash add product, which is the name we gave this folder where we put this page file in. And there's our headline. And now we can style this headline using class names. And if you haven't used or heard of Tailwind CSS before, the way this works is that we don't set up CSS files. Instead, we write our CSS directly in here by using different utility classes that each fulfill a single purpose. For example, we want to make this text a bit bigger. So we can type in and now we get autocompletion because remember we earlier set up autocompletion inside strings in the settings. And together with the Tailwind we escort extension, we get this autocompletion here, which is really useful. For example, we have text LG and here you can see what this actually does, which CSS attributes this actually changes. This sets the font size to this 1.125 RAM. So when we add this and save our changes, the font gets a bit bigger. You can also hover over one of these Tailwind classes to see the CSS that this applies. It changes the font size and the line height as well. Again, this only works if you have the Tailwind extension installed. Where do I get these classes from? Well, either you can just see what autocompletion suggests to you. Sometimes this is enough, but often you just have to look in the Tailwind documentation. So they describe all these different classes that you can use. At first, this can seem overwhelming, but you actually get used to this very fast. And you don't have to read all of this. You can just Google for Tailwind box shadow, for example, or you can search in the quick search here, and then you will find the necessary classes you have to use to apply a box shadow, for example. So let's add some more. We want to make the text bigger. We want to add the margin bottom for which we have these MB minus classes. We use MB minus three. This adds a bit of margin to the next element below, but we can't see it yet. We also want to make the text bold 
which we can do with font minus bold. And since we set up the prettier extension for Tailwind earlier, we can now reformat this code with our formatting shortcut. Again on Windows, this is Shift Alt F, and it will automatically reorder these classes here to the appropriate order. As you can see, it put the margin bottom to the front. Tailwind has a special convention for the order of these classes. I don't know what rules exactly they follow, but the prettier extension makes sure that the same order is applied everywhere, which really makes it easier to keep an overview over these classes. Then below the H1, I want to put a form. And in this form, we will later enter the product information to create a new product in our database. So this is a normal HTML form tag. And in here we put an input, which we can give a self-closing tag with a slash and a closing angle bracket. And we want to add some props to this input. When we save this, I think we should already see something. Yeah, we have this very uh, not good looking unstyled input here. We can style this again with Tailwind classes by adding the class name prop. So I want to add some margin bottom to this input and I want to set the width to 100%, for which we have this W full tailwind class. When we save this, the input field gets the margin and the full width. Now one downside of raw tailwind is that you start with completely unstyled elements, right? And you have to define all the CSS yourself. This can be a bit overwhelming because you often have to add a lot of classes to create a UI that looks good. This is why we also use Daisy UI in this project. Daisy UI basically adds more convenience classes that we can use to style different components. For example, somewhere here is a text input. This is what we want to add to our project. And this one here looks better than the one we have right now, right? And let's say we want to use text input with border. Here we can see the JSX. We already have an input and here are the class names. And these input and input border classes are coming from Daisy UI. They simply combine multiple Tailwind classes into a single one so that we don't have to style all of this from zero. So let's try this out. Input and input border. Let's add them here. Input. Let's hover over this. And as you can see, it contains quite a lot of CSS. And we want input bordered. When we save this, our input now looks much better. Of course, we still need some padding here so that the input field doesn't go all the way to the edges of the screen, but we will take care of this in a moment. And again, we can use the formatting shortcuts to reorder these classes properly. So input bordered moves to the front, followed by the remaining classes. Okay, but we still want to add some more props to the input field here. For one, we want to make it required so that we have to type something in before we can send this form. This is taken care of by the browser. We have to set a name. This way we can get the value out of this input field later. And the name will also be name because this field will contain the product name. Let's also set the placeholder. Let's set it to name as well. And when we save this, we get this placeholder here. We can type something in. And later we will get the product name out of this input field. Again, I use the formatting shortcut to format this properly and it also puts the closing tag into a new line. I really like Prettier for this reason. It also does stuff like adding parentheses automatically. So if we remove these parentheses here from the return statement and put it like this instead and use the formatting shortcut again, it adds these parentheses automatically. And I really like this because it helps you keep your formatting consistent throughout the whole project. Okay, and below our first input field, we put another input field for the product description. But since the description is usually longer, we don't use an input field, we use a text area, which is basically a big input field where we can put in larger amounts of text over multiple lines. We make this required as well. We set the name to description and the placeholder as well, just with an uppercase D which by default looks like this. We can change the size of this, which is really cool. But of course we want to style this using Daisy UI and Tailwind classes. Daisy UI gives us text area and text area bordered. 
and then again mv3 and w full. And now it looks like this with rounded corners and some highlighting. Then we need two more input fields below for the image URL and the price. So let's copy the input field that we already have, paste it two times because the styling will be the same. We change the name of the third one to image URL like this. We change the placeholder to image URL as well in readable form. And then we can set the type of this input field to URL. This way the browser checks that we actually put something in here that looks like a URL with HTTPS and so on. Otherwise the browser will not accept our input, which is really useful. And this down here is of course the price. We set the placeholder to price as well. And we set the type to number because this way we can only type numbers in here and no other characters. Now one thing that happens when you use Tailwind is that you often have repetition between classes. For example, all our input fields here have the same margin bottom and width class applied to them, right? Now you might be inclined to try to get rid of this by creating abstractions like separate components that already include these classes. But this is actually not necessary and you shouldn't do this too early. The Tailwind documentation actually talks about this. And one thing they recommend is to just use multi-cursor editing. For example, if we want to change the margin of all our input fields here, we can just click on the first one. And then in VS Code, we can press Ctrl D or Command D on Mac to select the next occurrence of this word. Now we have all four margin bottom three selected and we can change all of them at once to a different value if you want. So this is how you can work efficiently with Tailwind classes, even if you have to repeat yourself. Below the last input field, but still inside the form, we add a button, which will say add product. Then we go into the opening tag of the button and we set the type to submit. And when we have a button with type submit inside a form, it will automatically submit this form when we click this button. This is just default HTML behavior. And this down here is our button. As you can see in Tailwind, by default, nothing has any style applied to it. So right now it just looks like normal text. So let's add some class names to style this button. We use the daisy button class BTN, which styles this like a gray button. We can add some color with BTM primary and I also want this button to take up the full width so we also set this to btn block which I think just sets a width here of 100 and now it looks much better so our form is ready but again we need some padding on the edges of the screen it looks a bit weird right now but instead of doing this inside this page I want to do it in the layout tsx file Remember from my Next.js beginner tutorial that this is the root layout. It's located directly inside the app folder and this wraps all pages throughout our whole website. To be more exact, our pages are inside this children component here and this is rendered inside this HTML body. And in this layout we can add styling that we want to have applied throughout our whole website. For example, by default, this inter font from Google Fonts is applied to the whole body via this class name here. And this body wraps all pages, right? Now I want to wrap children into another tag, the HTML main tag, because each page contains the main content of the page. And we will later put the navbar above this main tag and the footer below. For now, I want to apply some styling to this main tag. Again, this styling will wrap all pages. For example, I want to add some padding, which we can do with this P-4 class. Now it already looks much better. I also want to have some max and min width applied to all pages, because as you can see, this takes up the full width of the screen, no matter how big the screen is. I want to constrain this. For this, again, we have different Tailwind classes available. Max minus W lets us set a max width. And I want to use the largest one here, which is 7XL. And we can see how big this is when I zoom out a bit, because when I record my videos, I always increase the size on the screen of everything, so it's easier to read. This is the real size this page and form have. 
And this is also the size it should have on your side. So now our pages don't get bigger than this anymore. So this is a 1920 pixel monitor and Max W 7 xl is 2080 pixels. But of course you can play around with this and use another value if you want. But of course I want to have this part here centered on the screen, right? We can do this with margin auto, which we set with M minus auto. Now this is centered on the screen. And I also want to set a min width, which we can do with min minus W. But here we don't have as many different options available. There aren't any classes by default for different screen sizes like we have for max width. But we can actually set an arbitrary size and this also works with max width. This also works with other attributes. When you want to do this in Tailwind CSS, we can add the value in square brackets like this after another minus. And in here we can write 300 px for example for 300 pixels. Now we set the min width to this arbitrary value of 300 pixels. And now when I make the screen very small, the page itself never gets smaller than 300 pixels because we don't want to squish it too much. But again, you can play around with these values and use other values if you want. As usual, we can press our formatting shortcut to have prettier realign everything properly. And then I also want to change the metadata here in this metadata object. We change the title from this default create next app to Flomazon. I explain metadata in my Next.js 13 beginner tutorial. This will now be the title of the page. When we save this, we can see Flomazon up here in the tab. And this will also show up, for example, when we paste a link to our website on social media. Let's also change the description. And I set this to our tagline, which is we make your wallet cry because we are an e-commerce app. So this way we change the metadata throughout our whole website. So all pages now have this Flomazon as the title and this description which shows up on social media. But we can also modify the metadata for specific pages, like for our ad product page here for example. We go all the way to the top above our component and we export this const metadata here as well. You have to make sure that the spelling is correct, all lowercase, otherwise Next.js will not recognize this. And here we just want to overwrite the title to the name of the page. Add product minus and then again Flomazon. And when we save this, we change the title, but only for this page. On all other pages, we still have the default Flomazon title. And as a reminder, as long as we don't use the use client directive at the top of the file, this whole component is rendered on the server. If we were fetching any data in this component, then this data would also be fetched server side and the client would only receive the finished page with the data inside it. But here we don't fetch any data, it's just static HTML. And now when we submit this form, we want to store a new product in our database, right? One way to handle this would be to turn this into a client component so that we can interact with this form client side and execute JavaScript. We could take the input of this form and send it via a fetch request to our own server endpoint, which then adds the product to the database. This is the usual flow. Why do we need a server endpoint? Well, we can't make database operations on the client. Why? Because this requires us to connect to our database. So we need our database credentials and we can't expose our database credentials on the client. Otherwise the user would be able to do anything they want with our database. This is why we have to route requests like this over our own server. So the server actually has the connection to the database and the user can just request to add this object, but they can't mess around with our database. So again, normally we would set up an API endpoint here in our Next.js project, which we can do with route handlers. Alternatively, you could also set up a separate server like an express server, for example, that runs on a completely different project. Then we would turn our page into a client component so that we can execute JavaScript, which is necessary to make a fetch request to our server. We would send the product data there and the server would then insert this data into the database. But as you already see, there are a lot of steps involved. And Next.js recently introduced server actions, which are still in alpha right now. And in a nutshell, they are basically a way to do server mutations directly in our components without having to set up an endpoint. So this is just more concise because we basically just put a function into our component and we can call this function. 
it's very intuitive and it's less work than setting up a separate endpoint. So let's go back into our project and see how this works. We can declare such a server function directly in a server component. If we had the use client directive at the top of the file, we could not put it in here. But since we don't have any client side features in this component, we can put our server action directly into this file. It will be an async function because we make a database operation. And let's call it add product. We can call the server action from a server component via this form here by adding the action attribute. This way we still don't need any JavaScript. This fully works in a server component. And here we simply pass our add product function. Now when we call this function, we get sent the data as form data. So we create a parameter form data and it will be of type form data. Then at the top of this function, we add this string that says use server. This is very similar to the use client directive that we have to put in a client component. This tells Next.js that this is a server action. Otherwise this will just not work. And in here we can do a database operation. So we can call await, then we use Prisma, which we import from our libdb folder that we set up earlier. Then when we click dot, we see product here. Where is this coming from? This is coming from our schema because we call the model product and this is connected to the products collection in our database. If you don't see product, then make sure that you executed this npx prisma generate command that we run earlier because this generates this prisma client. And whenever you make changes to your prisma schema, you have to recreate the client with the new functions available. I want to start this again with npm run dev. And on here we can call functions like create, for example, to create a new document. And we add the data of this document as an argument within curly braces. Now in this server function, we are allowed to call prisma.create, which again does a database operation. If you try to call prisma create in a client component, for example, when we click a button, then this will not work because again, database operations can only be done on the server. Even if you try this, you will get an error message because Prisma protects you from accidentally exposing your database credentials on the client. So it will throw an error if you try to do this. But inside a server action, we can do this because this will only be executed on the server. This code here never gets to the client. So again, this is the same as if we would have set up an API route in Next.js or a server endpoint in Express, for example. This is a little server endpoint to make post requests on. And inside create, we can pass data, another pair of curly braces, and in here we put the actual data of the product we want to create. So the name, the price, description, and so on. But of course, we first have to get this data out of this form data object here. So let's go above. We can get our values out of the form data by their name. We gave these input fields. It looks like this. We create a const name equals form data dot get. And here we pass the name of this field, which in this case is name. And this value is now of type form data entry value. We can get the actual input by calling to a string on it. Now the input can be empty, so this adds the save call operator, so name is string or undefined. Later we will also learn how we can call these server actions from client components. This is actually possible. And then we get the data not passed as form data, but as normal arguments. You will see all of this later. When we call a server action from a server component, then we basically have to do it over a form action because this doesn't require any JavaScript and this passes us the data in form of form data. Okay, let's get the other values out of here as well. Const description equals form data dot get description and again we call to a string. Then we do this for the image URL. And for the price. But the price is a number, so we wrap this into this number constructor, which passes the number string into an actual number. 
So in here again we pass form data get. The name of this field is price. We don't have to call to a string because number can actually handle this value. But again, form data get can return undefined, in which case the number will throw an error. So we add a fallback value here with two vertical bars and then we add a zero. So this will be the fallback value in case the price input is empty, just so that we don't get an error. But since we made all these fields here required with this required prop, I also want to check in this server action that we actually got these values, otherwise we will throw an error because we don't expect any of these inputs to be empty. So let's check if exclamation mark name or exclamation mark description or the image URL is missing or the price is missing. Then this is invalid input, so we will throw an error, which will say missing required fields or whatever you want us to say. So now since we check that these values are defined, down here they are guaranteed to be defined. So now we can pass the name, the description, the image URL and the price to Prisma. And this will create a new product document with this data. And after we edit the product, I want to redirect to the front page. So we call this redirect function, but this import here is wrong. When we select this, it adds the import like this, but we want to import this from next slash navigation. This is the correct one. And then we want to redirect to the front page, which we can do like this. So now we have some very simple validation here. If I try to send this without typing anything in, then the browser shows us a message here. And it should even detect when this is not a valid URL. Those are the native browser validation methods that we are using down here with required and the type prop. If you want to use something like React hook form here for validation, then this is also possible. But for this, you have to make this a client component because this requires JavaScript. But I want to keep this page a server component to show you how you can use server actions from server components. Later, we will also learn how to call server actions from client components, and then you can do everything that requires JavaScript. But again, in a server component, you use this form action here, and this simply sends the form data to the server action. And later we will also protect this route so that we can only add a new product if we are logged in. But we haven't implemented authentication yet, we will do this later. Now one more thing we have to change before we can try this out. Since server actions are still in alpha, we have to uh, enable them explicitly, which we do in the next config file. Here we go into this next config block. We add this experimental block colon curly braces and in here we have this server actions field which we set to true. This way we can use server actions in this project. One more thing, we will have images in our app that we will load from unsplash.com. This is just a nice website where you can find free images and we use this for our product images. If you watch my Next.js beginner tutorial, then you know that we have to allow the URLs where we want to load images from and we do this also inside the next config, you can put it above or below experimental, doesn't matter. Gonna put it above. We have this images field, again colon curly braces, we add a comma here. And in here we have this remote patterns value to which we pass an array. We pass an array of JavaScript objects. So square brackets, curly braces. And in here we can define a host name. You can add multiple of these if you want to load images from multiple sources. And the base address where we load these images from, we add this as a string, is images.unsplash.com. If we don't do this, then we will get an error later when we try to load these images. So we save this and then we have to restart our dev server. It stopped automatically. If it didn't, press Ctrl Z, confirm with Y, and execute npm run dev again. Otherwise the changes of next config will not be applied. Okay, now let's add some products. And to show you that this works without JavaScript, let's actually disable JavaScript. You don't have to do this, I just wanna show this to you. So in the Chrome dev tools, I can press Control shift p can search for disable JavaScript. And just to make sure that this is applied, I refresh the page. 
but we have to keep the Chrome DevTools open. When we close it, JavaScript will be enabled again. Again, you can get product images from Unsplash. Just go to unsplash.com and search for, I don't know, product images and use any of these here. Just open them, right click, copy image address, and then you can use this here as the image URL. For the name, description and price, you can write anything you want. I have already prepared some data. So this is the title. Just gonna copy paste this here, a description. And by the way, I use ChatGBT to come up with funny product titles and product descriptions. So I didn't come up with this myself. So the image URL is coming from Unsplash. Again, you can copy the image URL from there. And I set the price, for example, to 999, which is $9.99. Remember that JavaScript is still disabled, but when we click Add Product, all of this should work. We don't see a loading indicator yet, we will add this later, but we got redirected to the front page, so it seems that this worked. Let's check our database. So in Atlas, in our products collection, we should now see one entry with this data we inserted. And it automatically generates the created ad and updated ad timestamps. So this worked and we executed this over our server action here without having to set up a separate server endpoint and without any JavaScript. But when we added the product, we didn't have a loading indicator, right? Which is not great because we usually want to see that some request is running right now. We also want to disable the button so that we can't click it twice. Now we can't put a loading state into our server component here because a loading state requires JavaScript and state and those are client component features. But in a client component, we can't put a server action, at least not directly in there like we did here. But what we can do is we can make only the loading indicator a client component and we can use a special hook to hook into the loading state of this form here, even if the form itself is in a server component. This is a new hook they introduced just recently. It's also still experimental, but I want to show you how this works so you know all these different APIs that we have available. So I want to put the loading indicator directly into this button. So we extract this button into a separate component and make it a client component so that we can put a loading state in there. To make this button reusable, let's put it into a separate components folder, not into our app folder here. So I right click on SRZ and we create a components folder. In here we put a new file, which we call form submit button.tsx. But of course the name is up to you. This will be a client component, so we add the use client directive at the top. Again, I explain this in my next JS beginner tutorial. Then we want to export a component function from here form submit button. We want to add some props to this form submit button. So we create a type that we call form submit button props equals sign curly braces. Now if you watched my other Next.js and React tutorials then you know that I usually make these props in interface and not a type because it's generally recommended to use interfaces until you need a type but here we do need a type. Why? Because I want to extend this type and you can't do this with interfaces. I want to go down here after the closing curly brace, write ampersand, component props, which is an import from React, like this. And then we add a type to component props, which we do with angle brackets. And in here we pass button as a string. Component props is a really cool convenience type that we can use in React. This way our form submit button will not only accept the props that we put into the form submit button props, but also all the props a normal button accepts. For example, you can disable a normal HTML button with the disabled prop, right? And instead of putting this value in here directly, we can just say, okay, we want to accept all the same props a normal button expects. And this is what component props does. Again, this only works with type and not with interface. This is why I made the props a type this time. Okay, but we still want to add two more values right in our form submit button props. The first one is the children prop of type react.react.node. 
In case you don't know what a children prop is, this allows us to pass a component between the opening and the closing tag of another component. So in a normal button, we enter the text inside the opening and the closing tag, right? Like add product, for example. And we can do the same with our form submit button via this children prop. So whatever we pass in here between the opening and the closing tag of our form submit button will be passed via this children prop. This means that the name of this prop has to be spelled like this. If you change this, then this will not be recognized as the children prop anymore. And we also want to be able to pass some styling to this button from the outside. So we pass a class name, but we make this optional with a question mark. So we don't have to pass one. And this will be of type string. This way, whenever we call this form submit button component and use it somewhere, we can pass classes from the outside if we want, but we don't have to. Okay, and then we add these props here inside the parentheses of our form submit button. So we want to destructure them with curly braces as usual. Colon, we set the type to form submit button props. And now between the curly braces, we have children and class name. And then we want to return some UI in this block down here, right? Let's keep it simple for now, just to see that this works. We just add a normal button here. Between the opening and the closing tag, we add the children because we want to render the children that we pass to the form submit button as the children of the button we render in here. Let's save this and see if this works. We go back to our page and we replace this button here for our form submit button. Save this again. So it seems to work because we still have a button that says add product, but it's unstyled again because we haven't added any styling to this button in here yet. So let's finish this. Let's go in the opening tag of the button and add a class name here. But we remove the quotation marks and put curly braces here instead, because this way we can put a backtick string in here. A backtick string allows us to use normal string classes like btn and btm primary, but we can also put our class name in here additionally, because in a backtick string, we can put a variable with a dollar sign and curly braces. This way, both the button classes, but also our optional class name string are applied to this button. Let's try this out as well. Let's save this and you can immediately see that the styling changes. But this also means that we don't need the btn and the btm primary class on our page anymore because they are hard coded on this form submit button. But we don't want to hard code the button block value because I want to keep this optional. So we pass this from the outside as the class name prop instead. Okay, cool. Then I also want to set the type of this button to submit which of course again means we don't need this prop here anymore. Okay, so now our button works the same as before with the same styling and now we want to get the loading state in here. And as I already said, there is an experimental new hook that we can use to get the loading state of this form here, where this form submit button is placed in. Even if the form itself is in a server component, it's enough if the submit button is a client component. So we have to add another import curly braces from React DOM. So this is not coming from Next.js. This is actually coming from React 18. And in here we should find experimental use form status. But afterwards we also add S and we rename this so that we don't have to use this awkward long name here in our code. We rename this to just use form status. Then we can use this hook in our component. So again, we destructure a const and we call this use form status. This automatically hooks into the parent form of this button. And in here we have different values. We care about pending, which is the loading state. So when we submit our form until our server action here has returned, this pending will be set to true and we can show a loading indicator. I also want to disable the button while this is loading. So we set disabled to a pending 
And I also want to show a loading spinner here right next to the text inside this button. And for this again, we have daisy UI classes that we can use. Somewhere here should be a, a loading indicator. And there are different ones available. You can choose whatever you like. I want to use this one here. So back in our code, I put this inside the button tag. So between the opening and the closing tag, above the children, we add an expression in curly braces. If pending is true, so pending to ampersand signs, then we want to render the span with this loading indicator. So this is a span with a self-closing tag, which gets the class names loading and loading spinner. We let prettier reformat this properly. So this loading spinner will be shown while pending is true and pending is coming from the form status. One more thing we have to do, we accept these component props from the button, right? But right now we don't apply them to our button here. In order to do this, we go right here where we destructure our props and we write dot 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 props. This will catch all the remaining props that we pass to our form submit button, which don't have explicit names. So all the props that we pass for the button component props, basically. This is the syntax we have to use for this. And we also want to apply them to our button here, right? So we go in the button tag again, and we do this all the way at the top as the first prop. This way, the other props that we pass below will overwrite these props because we usually want these ones to have priority over whatever button props we pass. So we pass the rest props as the very first argument. In curly braces, again, we write dot 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 props. Now all these props that we pass here will be applied to our button tag. Okay, let's save everything and then try this out again. So now in this page, we are using our form submit button. It should still work the same, but it should have a loading indicator. And it should also be disabled while the server action is in progress. So again, I'm gonna copy some data over. Again, you can insert anything you want here. I already have a title and a description and an image URL prepared. And I'm going to set the price to $19.99. And now when we click this add product button, it should be disabled and should show a loading spinner. And this works. And after it's done, we get redirected to the front page. And we should see our new data in the database. And there it is. Okay, let's add another product and let's check what actually happens in the network tab when we execute a server action. So I want to go to the add product page again, add a new product. Again, I'm going to copy paste all of this over. Price $5. And maybe it's a good idea to uh, disable the redirect for a moment so that we keep the data in the network tab. So I'm gonna comment this out, but I will add this back later. Let's run this with the network tab open. And here we have our add product call. And in the headers tab, we can see that this actually makes a post request to the same page but this is basically treated like a server endpoint, a post endpoint. So this works just like a normal server endpoint where we send a post request to, just like this endpoint is not on a separate address, it's on the same address as this page. Okay, let's confirm that this newer product is also in our database. Yeah, there it is. Let's add the redirect back in. And lastly, for this section of the tutorial, I want to set up an error page, which will be shown if something goes wrong in here and we actually throw an error. This should usually not happen because we have input validation client side and Prisma database operations also don't fail unless the database is actually down, but we should still have a custom error page. And if you watch my Next.js beginner tutorial, then you already know how this works. We put a file with a special name into the app folder. So right click, we have to call it error.tsx. This way Next.js automatically turns this into the error page, which will be shown when something goes wrong. For example, if a fetch fails in a server component or a server action. 
the error page has to be a client component so we add the use client directive at the top and this is always the case for error tsx and next.js they always have to be a client components i'm not sure why i think because of the way the error is passed to them but they have to be client components export default function let's call it error page again the name is up to you and here we just want to return some very simple ui a diff that says something went wrong please refresh the page of course you can make this more sophisticated if you want let's actually try this out so let's say uh, here in our server action we just pass a test error bazinga we also have to comment out this part just for a moment and now when we send something here we should see our error page something went wrong now i think they are also planning to add an error field to the use form status hook so that we can get the error in here and handle it client side instead of redirecting to this error page which can be a bit of a jarring user experience but right now we only have the loading state in here there is no error state in here yet so the easiest way to handle errors client side and server actions is just to fall back to this error page but again usually the user shouldn't get there so let's remove this again and now that we have some data in our database we can change our front page and render our products here right so let's do that next okay let's go to the home page which is the page tsx file that's the direct child of the app folder this one here that contains the home component and then let's remove all of this crap here and set it up from scratch so we add a div in the return block and then we make this an async function remember by default pages in the app directory are server components unless we add the use client directive meaning that we can do a database operations and all kinds of asynchronous stuff right inside this component because this will be executed on the server not on the client and just like in a server action making database requests and using credentials in here is also safe because they will not be leaked to the client this means we can just call prisma here so let's create a const products to fetch all the products from our database and assign this to await prisma which again we import from our lib folder dot product dot find many parentheses curly braces in here we can add a filter or a sort order and we want to order products by colon curly braces and i want to order the products in descending order so that we have the newest one at the top now we could order this by the created add timestamp right but it's actually better to use the id why because the id also contains a timestamp but the id is unique whereas theoretically two products could have the exact same timestamp so when you want to order documents in mongodb by that timestamp it's better to use the id colon and then in here we pass desc for descending as a string so now we order these products by the id in descending order with the newest one at the top and then we want to render cards for each of these products right and for this again we use daisy ui which contains this card component that we can use so let's go back into our project let's put it in the components folder because we want to reuse this in different places let's call it product card .tsx. we export default function as usual with the same name this product card will also take a prop so let's create an interface again you can use a type or an interface it doesn't matter but it's usually recommended to use interface unless you need a type we needed a type earlier to combine it with component props but here an interface is enough let's call it product card props and each product card will take one product as input and the type of this is product with a capital P we didn't get auto completion but we can get the product type from our database through an import from prisma so import we destructure this from 
at Prisma client and in here should be the product type that's coming from our Prisma schema. So we pass one of these products to our product card. We destructure this here so that we can render the information of this product in this card. For now, let's save this and let's render one of these product cards in our div. Just a single one for now so that we can see the card on the screen while we are building the UI. So in here, I'm gonna put a product card and for the product, for now, we just hard code products at the index zero. So the first element here. Again, just so that we can see it in the UI while we are building it. We save this, but we still have to return UI from the product card. So let's put a return statement here. I want to make the outer element of this card a link, a next link, so that when we click this card, we get forwarded to the product page. So we add the next link here. We set the href to a string to the page where we will see the details of this product. We haven't set up this page yet, but we will do so later. We will put the URL at slash products slash and then we append the product ID. So auto completion product ID. And to this link, we add the class names that style this card. And I think we also have to refresh the page here to show our changes. Ah, okay, the development server isn't running right now. So I restart this, refresh the page again, and we don't see anything yet, but we will see something in a moment. So this link gets the card class, which is coming from Daisy UI. We set W minus full to make the card take up the full available width. We will later display this card in a grid. We set BG base 100. This is the background color, will be a light whitish color. I also want to set hover colon shadow XL. This, as the class name implies, adds a shadow to our card. But with this modifier here, hover colon, it only applies the shadow when we hover over the card with the mouse. You will see this in a moment. And then we can also add a transition for this shadow with the transition shadow class. Okay, let's close this link tag. And in here we render the contents of the card. Let's see how this looks if we just put some text in here for now. Yeah, this is the card. We have our hover shadow effect, but of course this doesn't look great yet. So let's remove text and instead we add another div in here inside the link with the contents of the card. We add a class name to this outer div called card minus body. This adds the appropriate padding and everything to a style this card body. And in here we put an H2 headline. But again, in Tailwind CSS, all components are unstyled by default, including buttons and headlines. So to style this properly, we add the card minus title class. And in here we want to render the name of the product, which we get from the product object that we pass to this card. Okay, let's save this, see how this looks. Already looks better, right? And we have this cool hover shadow effect with a transition. You can play around with this. You can try out different styling, different shadow values, but this is fine for our card here. Below the H2, I want to put some more text with the paragraph tag. In here, I want to render product.description. which looks like this. This is coming from our database. And then I also want to add a price tag. For this, first of all, we need to set up a function that formats the price properly. Because remember, the price is just stored in cents, but we want to show it as dollar. We can put this function into the lib folder here. So let's right click on lib, new file. Let's call it format.ts. And from here, we export a function that we call format price. And to this, we will pass the price as a number. 
and then we want to return the formatted value. So what we do is we turn the cents into a dollars first by simply dividing price by 100. Then we want to format this value in US dollar, which we can do by culling dot to a local string. As the first argument, we have to pass the local, so basically the language to which we want to format this. And we want to format this to en minus us in uppercase like this. So we format the string in American English. Then we pass a comma and a block of curly braces where we can do some configuration. And here we can set the style to currency. And we set currency to USD. This will take care of formatting this price properly in US dollar with the US dollar symbol and the correct decimal point and whatever. I think this is a bit better than doing it manually. So we save this. We can also reformat it with prettier. Then I want to create another component in the components folder called pricetag.tsx. Again, we will reuse this component in different places. In here we export a default function price tag which will call our format price function that we just set up. But to this component we pass the price tag props which needs the price which again is a number and again I want to be able to style this price tag from the outside so again I add this optional class name string here that we already saw earlier. And then we pass these props to the price tag component and destructure them here. And then down here, I want to return a span, which contains the formatted price. So between curly braces, I call our format price function, which we export from our lib folder and to this, we simply pass our price. And then we also want to style the span again with class names from Daisy UI. Again, we add a backtick string here with curly braces and two backticks. Daisy UI has this batch class, yeah, which styles this like a little batch, like a price tag. And then we also want to put our optional class name in here. And that's it for this component. Okay, let's go back into our product card. And here below the description, I want to render a price tag. And for the price prop, we pass product.price. Okay, let's see. This product costs $5 and this is rendered by our format function with the dollar symbol and the decimal point. But of course, we also want to render the image of the product, right? We do this above the card body, still inside the card link. And in the Daisy UI documentation, they wrap this image into a figure. I'm not 100% sure why, but it's best to follow this. But in here, we don't use one of these normal HTML images, because in Next.js, we should usually use the next image, which is an import from next slash image because these images are optimized. They are automatically resized by Next.js to the appropriate size and they have some other cool features that the normal HTML image doesn't have. So for the SRZ, so for the image source, we pass product.image URL. This is the image we want to show. For the alt text, we can pass product.name. When we use the next image, we have to set the width and height so Next.js knows at which size it has to load this image. We set this to 800 width and 400 height. Now, since our cards are responsive, the final dimensions of the image will actually be defined by CSS and not by these values here. So our images might not be shown in 800 times 400. This is just the size at which we load this image. So no matter how big the image is, even if it's 4000 pixels, Next.js will resize it to 800 times 400 pixels. And I picked this value because those are the largest dimensions in which this image will be shown later. 
If we would make these dimensions smaller, then the image would be blurry. If we would make them bigger, then we would load an unnecessarily a large image. And to style this image properly, we again add class names. H48 sets the height of this image in the card. We want each card and each card image to have the same height. And then to not make our image distorted, because the dimensions of the image inside the card might be different of the intrinsic dimensions that the image file has. And to not distort this image, we set object cover, which basically send or crops the image. So if the image is too big or has the wrong dimensions, then it will just be cut off so it fits into our card image. Okay, let's save this. And there is our image. And again, this image changes depending on the screen size. And here you can see the object cover in action. There's one more thing I wanna do in this product card. If the product is newer, I want to add a little badge that says newer because this looks cool. So above the return statement in the product card, we create a const is newer. And here we simply check if date.now, which is the current timestamp, minus we want to compare it to the created add timestamp of the product. But this is a string and to turn this into a date, we have to create a new date. And to this new date constructor, we pass product.createdAd, which turns this into an actual date. And to get a timestamp out of this date, we call dot get time. And now we can compare to date.now, which also returns a timestamp. And if the difference between these two is seven days, you can of course also pick another value. Then I want to show this is newer batch. So if date.now minus the date of the created add timestamp is less than seven days, but those values are milliseconds. So we have to calculate the days. 1000 milliseconds times 60 seconds are one minute, times 60 seconds are one hour, times 24 hours are one day, times seven for seven days. So now is newer will be truer if our product is less than seven days old. And when this is newer, we want to render a little batch, which I want to put into the H2 tag here after the product name. Here we put an expression, if is new is true to Amazon Science. Then we want to render another div in here that just says new in all uppercase. And we style this div to a batch with the batch and the batch secondary class name, which gives it the secondary color that we set in our theme. Let's save this and there's the batch. Our secondary color is this yellow. But now that I see it, maybe it would be better if we don't place it inside the title, right? But rather below it. Maybe here, I think this looks better. So I put it below the H2 tag. So our product card itself is done, but we still want to render these products in a proper grid, right? So let's remove this hard-coded product card here. And I want to render our products as a grid, but I want to render the first product in this special hero view here that you saw in the beginning. With this background and this button, it just looks a bit cooler. Again, this is coming from Daisy UI. So let's do that in here. In this first div, we put another div for this hero view. This inner div gets the class names hero, rounded XL, which gives this whole element rounded corners, and BG base 200 for the background color. And in here we put the next image, which will load the image for the first product. So again, products at the first index dot image URL. Similarly, the alt text will contain the first product's name. We set the width to 400 and the height to 800. But again, the final dimensions of the image will be defined by CSS. Those are just the dimensions to which we resize the image before we load it. To style this image, we add the class names W full. We set the max width to SM 
so that the image at most has a width of 24 rem. We make the corners of the image rounded with rounded LG. So LG and XL and so on are just the different values for the border radius. So rounded XL has a border radius of 0.75 rem and LG has 0.5 rem. This is just up to your personal preference. And I want to set shadow to XL to give this image a drop shadow. And since this is the first image that we see on the screen above the fold and the most important image, we add this priority prop, which signals to Next.js that it should load this image first. You should use this on the, yeah, the largest image basically that is shown on the screen. So let's save this and look what we see. Well, it doesn't look great yet. We still need to show the product information and align this properly. What we do is we wrap this image into another div. So a third div right here. We put the closing tag below the image and we style this div here with the class names hero minus content. Flex call to make this a flex box column where the elements are aligned below each other. But then we also write LG colon flex row. And this is how you create responsive layouts in Tailwind CSS. Because this means on small screens, this will be a flex column, so the elements will be aligned below each other. But as soon as we get to the LG breakpoint, which is a screen breakpoint, so a certain size of our screen, then we use a flexed row instead, meaning that the elements will be aligned horizontally instead of vertically. So again, whatever modifier we use here will be applied on large screens and upwards. And whatever we use without a modifier will be used on small screens. And we don't have to add a modifier for small screens here, because this LG modifier basically means greater than or equal to. So if the screen is greater than or equal to LG, then we will always use a flex row. And if it's below that, then we will use a flex call. This needs a bit getting used to, but this is how you create responsive layouts in Tailwind. And then right below the image, but inside this inner div, we put another div for the text of this hero item. This doesn't need any styling, but in here we put an H1 that we style with text5xl, which sets the text size. We use font bold, which is self-explaining. And in this H1, we want to render the name of the first product, right? So again, products at the index zero dot name. And there's the title of this hero element. And since the screen is so small right now and we are zoomed in, this flex call is applied, right? But if I make this window big, then flex row is applied and these elements are aligned horizontally. And on small screens, they are aligned vertically. You can also see this switch here when we reach this breakpoint. And again, this breakpoint is defined by this LG colon. You can see in the Tailwind documentation what exact pixels value this breakpoint has. You can also modify this, but this is not necessary for us. Okay, let's finish the diff down here. Below the H1, we put a P tag, which we give some vertical padding, which we can do with PY minus six. Y is the vertical axis. For horizontal padding, you can use PX. And again, in here we render products at the index zero dot description. And there it is. And then I want to add a button that brings us to the product page. Below the paragraph tag, we put a next link. Make sure it imports the next link. We set the href of this link to slash products, the same URL we used earlier, slash, and then the ID of this first product. So products at the index zero dot ID. And we want to render this link like a button, but we shouldn't make it a button. First of all, because this is a server component and we can't handle clicks in a server component, but also when we link to another page, then we should actually render a link and not a button element. It can look like a button, but it should be a link, which is important for accessibility. You always want to use the correct HTML element. 
But again, we can style this as a button with btn and btn primary. And then we close this link. And yeah, the link of course doesn't contain any text yet, which we add between the link tags. Mm, check it out, for example. Okay, so this is now a link that looks like a button, which brings us to the product page that we haven't set up yet. And again, this is responsive. So on larger screens, it looks like this. On smaller screens, it looks like this. And below this hero item, we want to render the grid with the remaining items. Just have to see in which div we want to put this. We want to put this below the hero div here. So below this one, inside the outer div. In here, we put another div, which we render as a CSS grid. Again, with Tailwind class names. First of all, we set MY minus 4, which is a vertical margin. Again, M stands for margin and Y stands for the vertical axis, so top and bottom. We want to render a grid with the grid class. And then we define how many columns this grid should have. And again, this depends on the screen size, right? So we use different breakpoints. We start with grid calls 1 for one column, which will be applied on small screens. On medium sized screens, MD colon, we want to set grid calls to tour. So we show tour columns on slightly larger screens. And then we add a third breakpoint, XL. And I figured this out by just playing around with different breakpoints and see when it looks good. On large screens, we want to show three columns. And to add some space between the single cards in the grid, we can add the gap for class. So those are all the classes we add here. Then we close this div and render the actual product cards in here. We already have the product card component set up, right? So here we can now put an expression. We want to render all our products in here, except for the first one, because we already rendered the first one here in this hero view. So what we do is we call products.slice and pass the index 1. This will return a new array without the first element. And then we want to take each of these product objects and map them to a product card, right? So in here we get past each product, not produce, but product. And after the right arrow, we add parentheses. And in here we want to render a product card for each product. If you don't know what map does, then you probably haven't worked with React before and you have to watch a beginner tutorial first. But this way we turn each of these products in the array into a product card that we can then render in the UI. The product card expects the product object, which we get passed by the map function. And when we render a list, we also have to set a key. This is required for React to uh, re-render lists efficiently. And here we have to set a unique value for which we can use the unique idea of the product. And then we close this. And when we save this, there's our grid. Right now we only have three products in total. So let's add some more over the add product page. So I'm gonna go ahead and add a few more products, but I will skip this part in this video because you already know how this works. Just go ahead and add a few more products so that we can show something in our grid. So I went ahead and added some more products and now we can see our full grid. Doesn't it look beautiful? And each card has a hover shadow. And when we click the card, we get to the details page of this product, which doesn't exist yet. And this grid is fully responsive. So on large screens, we have three columns. When we make the screen smaller, we get to two columns and eventually to one. And this is the largest width at which our card images are displayed. And this is around 700 something pixels, as you can see up here. This is why I set the width of the image in the product card to 800. This way we make sure that we always have an image that is large enough, but not too large. When we open one of these images in a new tab, you can see that the width is approximately 800 pixels which again is the largest size at which we need this image, which is shown when we only have one column. 
Okay, later we will also add pagination to this page so that we don't load all products at once. And as a reminder, by default, server components in React are statically cached, meaning that all these products are fetched when we compile the project here in our server component. And then even if we reload the page after we added new products, we won't show these new products, at least not in production. In order to always show the newest products, we have to revalidate this page. But this will not be necessary when we later add the search param for the page that we are currently on, because as soon as we add search params to a server component in Next.js, it's automatically dynamically rendered. But don't worry if this is confusing to you right now, you will see how this works later. Okay, since we are already linking to our products detail page through our cards here, let's set up this product detail page next. So we go into our project and remember the URL for our products page was slash products slash and then the ID of the product. So in the app folder, we create a new folder. And again, I explain how this routing structure works in my Next.js 13 beginner tutorial. We wanna have a folder called products. And in here we want another folder where we put the ID of the product because this is part of the URL. So slash products slash ID. And finally in here we put a file page.tsx to render a page at this path. So let's set up the props for this page. Product page props. And in here we want to get the ID out of the URL so that we can use this idea to load the correct product from our database, right? And we get this over the params value because params will contain the ID placeholder that we put into our path here. So params is another object which contains the ID, which is a string. And then we can pass this to our page component, which then loads the product. So we export a default async function here, which we call product page. And it takes the product page props in which we can find the params and we destructure this further with a colon and a pair of curly braces. And in here is the idea, right? And this is a normal server component. So we can make our database request directly in here. We create a const product. We call await prisma dot product dot find unique. And this allows us to find a product by its idea. In parentheses and curly braces, we write rare colon, add another pair of curly braces, and in here we pass the idea. So we want to find a single product where the ID is the same as the ID we pass in the URL. Now the product we get back from this find call can be null because it might be the case that the product with this ID doesn't exist, right? And in this case, we don't want to render an empty page. Instead, we want to forward the user to the 404 not found page. We already saw this not found page earlier when we just enter any route that doesn't exist. By default, it looks like this. But this is not great. For one, it's not styled at all. But also no element that we put into our root layout is shown on this 404 page. So when we later put a navbar and a footer in here, this navbar and footer will not be shown on the 404 page. And it's a really bad user experience because they don't have anything to click. They just see this empty page. But if you watched my Next.js 13 beginner tutorial, then you know that we can overwrite this not found page and show our own one, which will be rendered inside our root layout here. So let's do that next. For this, we add another file to the app folder, which we call not minus found.tsx. And again, as for all these special files, the naming of the file is important because only this way Next.js will recognize this as the 404 page. This page will be very simple. We export a simple component that we call not found or not found page. The name of the component itself doesn't matter. And here we simply return a diff that says page not found. Again, you can make this more sophisticated, but I want to keep it simple here. Now, when we open a page that doesn't exist, it renders our own not found page. And later our navbar and our footer will also be shown here. So, and now with this not found page in place, 
we can also redirect to it dynamically, which we want to do if our product is null. For this we check if exclamation mark product, so if it's null or undefined, then we call this not found function, which is an import from next slash navigation again. This redirects us to the not found page, the same one we see here on the left side, but only if product is null. And below we can now render our product page because we know that the product now has a value. So in the return block we render a div and we add some class names to this div. We want to make this a flex box. We want to render a flex column by default. But again on LG screens and larger, we want to render a flex row instead to make this responsive. And inside the div we put the product image and then the name and the description. So in here we put a next image, make sure it's adding the correct import. We set SRZ to the image URL of the product we loaded up here. Similarly, we set the alt text to the name of the product. We set the width and the height both to 500, but Tailwind CSS actually sets the final height of the image to the intrinsic height the image file has. For example, if the image has a width of 500 and a height of 200, then the image we see on the screen will also be 500 times 200. And when Next.js resizes an image, I think it only takes the width into account. The height doesn't really matter, only to reserve space. So even if the real height of the image is larger than 500, then this will still work. It will only resize it to have the appropriate width. Anyway, if you just use these values here, then it will work. And I want to add some rounded corners to this image because this looks better, which we do with rounded LG again. And again, this is the largest image and the only image shown on this page. So we set the priority attribute. And below this image, still inside this div, we put another div for the product text. We set the h1 to the product name. And we style this h1 with text 5xl, which again sets the font size and we make it bold again. Below the product name, I want to render a price tag instead. We already set up this component earlier. And for the price, we pass product.price, right? And to the price tag, we can pass an optional class name, which we want to do now, because I also want to add some margin top with MT-4 to this price tag. And below, we put a product description, which is just a paragraph tag product.description and we add the py-6 class name to add some vertical padding. Okay, let's save this and let's navigate to a product page. There it is. It's responsive, but we still need some gap between the text and the image. But we already move between a flex column and a flex row at the appropriate breakpoint. To get some room between the image and the text, we use gap4. And gap is better to use than a margin here because a gap will work no matter if it's a flex column or a flex row. This way we don't have to decide between a margin top or a margin end, for example. So now we get some space here, which also works on larger screens. And I also want to send this text here, but only when we have a flex row, right? So only on large screens. So we add LG colon items center. Item center is the class for a line item center in CSS. And now it should look good. Now it looks like this on large screens, but it's responsive. And it even gets smaller on small screens until we reach the min width which we set to 300 pixels earlier. 
Okay, and I also want to set the metadata of this page. By this time, I don't want to hard code the title and the description. Instead, I want the title to contain the product name and the description to contain the description of the product. If we want to generate the metadata dynamically, we don't export this metadata value that we used earlier. Instead, we have to export another function. Outside of the product page component function, we export another async function called generate metadata and the spelling of the function name has to be correct. Again, otherwise Next.js will not recognize this. This will return a metadata object, which is an import from Next again. And by defining the return value here, we get auto completion when we later construct this metadata object. But since this is an async function, we have to wrap this return value into a promise because all async functions return a promise. Why do I make this an async function? Well, we actually have to fetch the same product from the database in this function here as well in order to get the name and the description of the product. We actually can't share data between the page and generate metadata. We have to fetch the product in both places. But now you might say, isn't it wasteful to fetch the data from the database twice? And of course it's wasteful. This is why we have to cache this product that we get from our database so that we only fetch it once. This is done for you automatically only if you use the fetch function that we have in JavaScript. If you use fetch to fetch data from some API, then this is cached and deduplicated for you automatically. However, if we use something like Prisma or Axios or anything else to fetch our data, then we have to cache it manually. If you don't do this, then we actually do a two database operations. And this, of course, is very wasteful. If you want to confirm this, then you can try out fetching the data here twice and lock your database operations, which we can do by passing lock to our Prisma client here. But I don't remember what you have to pass for the value. You have to look this up in the documentation. This allows you to lock all your database operations. And then you can see that this is executed twice. But I already did this, so I can confirm it for you. In order to deduplicate this request, we have a cache function from React, which is also pretty new. So what we do is we create a const that we call get product, and then we call this cache function here, which is coming from React. To cache, we can pass another async function and the return value of this async function we pass here will be cached. And here we basically want to execute this part. We want to fetch our product from the database and then return it. And for this, we need the ID of the product, right? So in here, this async function that we pass will take one argument, the ID as string, and then we create an error function like this with a right error and a block of curly braces. So now we pass this function to the react cache function. And in here we can simply cut out this part, put it in here, and then we simply return this product. And now down here where we had this function before, we create a const product again, but this time we call await get product, which is this cached function up here. And we pass the product ID to this function. Now we still get the same product, but it's coming from this cached value here. And now we can do the same and generate metadata. And this way, this will only be executed once. And this value will be shared between these two functions. We still need the product ID in generate metadata, right? And this can actually take the same props as the page. So we pass this in here, and then we only have to return the metadata that we now can generate from this product information. Okay, so we return a JavaScript object, and again, since we added this return value here, we now get auto-completion. For example, we can set the title just as we did before, but now we can generate the title from the product name, and then I want to append this dash flowmazon. Oops behind it, like this. I also want to set the meta description to the product description. And again, we can see this later when we post a link to our website on social media. And we will actually do this. We will actually deploy our project. And then I will show you these previews. And I also want to override the open graph image. 
so der Image, der das schon on Social Media. By default, that's this open graph image file that I put in the starting code, but we can overwrite this dynamically for a specific page, and I want to show the product image instead. For this, we can add this open graph value to the metadata, which again takes a JavaScript object, and here we can pass images, colon, we pass an array. This array contains another block of curly braces, and here we can set the URL to a product.image URL. Again, we can't see this right now because yeah, only the title is shown here in the browser. We have to refresh the page and there it is, thorned hill slicers, but you will later see these other values after we have deployed our project. Okay, on this product page, I also want to put the button that allows us to yeah, add this product to the cart. But before we do this, I want to create the loading page. Again, I explain this in my Next.js beginner tutorial. The loading page will be shown when we open a server component and it's still loading because we are fetching all this data before we actually show this page on the screen, right? This is all fetched server side, not client side, which means that it can take a while before the page is shown. And to not make it feel unresponsive to the user, we can add the loading page that will be shown while a page is loading. We put this right in the app folder and again, the name has to be exact loading.tsx and in here we export a simple component again which we call loading page or loading and from here I want to return another span with the class names loading which again is coming from daisy UI loading dots is a different kind of loading indicator then the size loading LG M auto, which sends us this loading indicator horizontally on the screen. And the last class I want to set is block, which sets this to display block. This is necessary for M auto to work. And then we close this and then we have our loading page. We should see this in action if we go to the front page again. Yeah, there it was for a short moment. But when we click a product, we should also see the loading page while the product is loading. Hmm, it wasn't there. Yeah, I think we don't see it because Next.js prefetches these pages. But you see it when we refresh the front page, right? But this will also be shown sometimes when we open a product page or another page. Okay, and the next step is to create the actual shopping cart in our database and add a button with which we can add products to our cart. Really exciting. Okay, the next step is to add our shopping cart model to our database so that we can actually put products in there. So let's go into our schema.prisma file again. And we could make the changes in the database first and then use introspection again to change the schema here, but it's actually easier to do it the other way around, to modify the schema and then push the changes to our database. So below our product model, we create a new model which we call cart. So model cart curly braces. Each model in our database needs an ID. So let's copy the ID line from the product model and paste it here. This does the same. It creates an ID automatically for us of type Mongo object ID. And we can also copy these two timestamps here so that we know when we created and last updated a cart. And for the items we put in the cart, we create yet another model. Model, which we call cart item. And we ignore this error message here for now. Now we could also put the cart items as an array directly into the cart document. But this makes it harder to work with because then we always have to fetch the whole array when we want to modify it, even if we just want to change the quantity of a single item. Also documents in MongoDB have a size constraint, meaning that we can't make this card item array grow indefinitely. Now in practice, this is probably not a problem, but it's still good practice to put these card items into a separate collection, in my opinion. So again, each card item needs an idea. So we copy paste this line. This is the ID of the document itself. And each card item also needs the ID of the product it references, right? So we know which product is in the card. So we create another field below product ID and don't worry about the alignment right now. We will reformat this file at the end. 
This is also of type string and it's a MongoDB object idea. So we write the same as here at the end of the ID line at db dot object ID. But this product ID is not auto generated like the ID of the document itself. This is just the ID of the product we put in there. Then we also need the quantity so we know how many of these products we put into the card, which will be of type int. And we need the ID of the card that this card item belongs to. And the card then belongs to a user. So we add another field below, card ID, which again is a string that contains a db.object ID. Okay, let's format the document to align everything properly. Again, on Windows, that's Shift Alt F. If you are on Mac or Linux, you can also search for the format document shortcut here. But right now we are just storing these IDs. It's also useful if we tell Prisma what model these IDs belong to, because this makes it easier later to work with. For this, we can use relations. So what we do is below the product ID, we also write product, which will be of type product. And product is our product model up here. Then we write add relation. And between the parentheses, we write fields colon pair of square brackets and then we pass our product ID which is this field up here that contains the ID of the product. After the closing square bracket we write comma references let me make this big ID that's the ID field of the product here so that we know that one product ID is connected to the ID of the product and now when we press the formatting shortcut I think Prisma should add something to the product model as well. And of course, reformat our code. So shift alt F and it added this card item array to our product model. This is the counterpart to this line down here. So they always belong together. Because now that each card item references a product, we can also fetch all card items that contain a product through the product model. And if we deleted this line, then we actually get an error because they always belong together. And then we want to do the same for the card. So we store the card ID here, which belongs to a card document in our database. So below we write card of type card. And again, add relation, which field does it reference the card ID, which belongs to the ID in the card model. Again, we press the formatting shortcut and it adds this line to the card model. And this one here is especially useful because this allows us to fetch all the card items with all their product information that belong to a particular card. This is important later to fetch the whole card with all its data. But I want to rename this field. I want to call it just items and put it here above the timestamps. And I also want to rename the collections. Again, lowercase and plural because that's convention for MongoDB. So again below we write add add map and the name of the collection which will be cards and the same for the card items here. Since they are their own model they live in their own collection. Card items in our lowercase. One more thing. We go to our product relation in the card item again after the references field. Write comma on delete in camel case like this and then cascade with an uppercase C. What this does is, if we delete a product, all the card items that contain this product will also automatically be deleted because we can't have an item in our cards for a product that doesn't exist anymore, right? That's it with the changes in our model for now. So again, let's reformat this, let's save it, and then we have to push the changes to our database. So we open the terminal and stop the execution of our dev environment. Then again, as I mentioned in the beginning, we run npx prisma db push, which pushes these new changes to our database. Here you can see what it does. It created two new collections for the cards and the card items. So let's take a look into our database here. Yeah, we have two new collections. And if we set up any special indexes or so in our model, then this will also push to the database with npx db push. But right now, of course, these collections are empty. So let's go back into our project. 
And then we also run npx prisma generate to regenerate our prisma client so that we have our new models available on the prisma object and can make database operations. So now when we take a look at the place where we use our prisma client like here for example and use auto completion we now have the card and the card item here available as well. This is what prisma generate does. It creates a new prisma client with the correct schema inside it. Okay, let's run the development environment again. And then we want to add a button to our product detail page to add this product to our card. And then we want to put this button on our product detail page here below the description. But this time I also want to have a success message. So after we added a product to the card, I want to have a little text that says a product added or something like that. But the use form status that we are used in our form submit button here only contains this loading state. It doesn't contain a success state, at least not yet. They might add this in the future, but for now we have to handle the success state ourselves. And since this is state, we can only do this in a client component because only a client component can contain state. This is why this time we can't execute our server action in a server component. But what we can do is we can wrap all of this logic into the button itself so that only the button has to be a client component and the product page itself can stay a server component because again, server components are more efficient. Since we will only use this button on this page, let's put it not in the components folder, but right here in the product ID folder, right next to the page itself. Because in the Next.js app router, we can collocate these files with the pages. We call it add to card button.tsx. And then in here, we create a client component with the same name. To this add to card button, we will add the ID of the product that this button belongs to. So we create an interface for the props. And in here we put the product ID in form of a string. And then we pass this to the component. And then let's set up the layout of this button. So we put a return block here. We wrap this all into a diff because next to the button will be the success message. And to align them properly, we set the class name to flex, items center, and gap tour for some spacing. And into the diff, we put the button itself, which we style with btn, btn primary. We set an on click handler on this button, but for now, we just pass an empty arrow function like this because we will take care of this later. Then we close this button tag and set the text to add to cart. Mm, before we continue, let's save this and put this button into our layout to see how it looks. So on the product ID page, we put the button below the description. Add to cart button. And for the product ID, we pass the ID of the product that we load on this page. And there's our button. I also want to put an icon in here, a shopping cart icon, and I have to copy paste this because this is an SVG. There it is. Again, I will link this in the description below and you can copy it from there. You can also leave this out for now. It doesn't matter. The text here is enough. And now again, we want to handle this action via a server component because this way we don't have to set up an API route handler and instead we can just call a function in our code right here. But we can't declare server actions inside client components. So we can't put the action directly here into this file. However, you can still import server actions into client components. That's possible. You just have to declare the server action in a separate file. So let's put this file into the same folder here in the products idea route new file and the naming convention for this is usually just actions but you can give this any name you want and here we put the server actions that belong to this route remember when we created the server action on the add product page we used this use server directive here at the start of the function since this file will only contain server actions we can put this all the way at the top this way we only have to declare it one time and not in each function if we added multiple functions to this file. 
Okay, and then we export an async function. Let's call it increment product quantity because this is what this function does, right? And it takes the product idea as an argument. And I have a very nasty typo here at product quantity. Now it should be correct. In here we want to fetch the card or create one if it doesn't exist yet. But we haven't set up functions that let us create or modify a card yet. And since we want to work with our cards from different places, we don't put these database functions right in here. We put them into a separate file so that we can reuse them. This time we put them into the lib folder. And here into a db, let's create a new file called card.ts. So here we put database operations on our card that we want to reuse in different places. But those are not server actions. Those are just functions we use in our server actions. So we don't have to put the use server directive here at the top. Let's start with the function that creates a new card. So export async function, create card, doesn't take any arguments. And in here we create a const new card. And then we call await prisma, which again we import from the prisma file in the lib folder. Dot card dot create. I think this is self explaining. And we want to create an empty card. So for data, we just pass an empty pair of curly braces because we don't want to put any data in there yet. We just want to create an empty card, but it will contain the timestamps. Now later when the user is logged in, we can connect a card to a user account. But if the user is not logged in, we also want to support anonymous cards, right? But how do we later find this card in the database? How do we know that a user belongs to a certain card if they are not logged in? For this, we will store the ID of the card in a cookie in the browser of the user. And later we can read this cookie to get the correct card again. And we can do this with this cookies function from Next.js. We can call this with parentheses and then we have this set function there. And then we give this cookie a name. I'm going to call it local card idea, but you can give it any name you want. And in here we want to store new card dot idea. And as simple as that, we can set a cookie. Now in production, you should make this more secure. You should encrypt the card idea because a user can modify the cookies and this way they could just guess the ID of another card. And if they are successful, they could change the contents of the card of another user, theoretically. Of course, the damage of doing this is lower, but in a real production app, you should take care of this. And the cookie itself also needs some additional security settings, but I skipped this step here for simplicity because it doesn't really add anything to this tutorial and it only matters if you really want to deploy this e-commerce website to production. Otherwise, this here is enough and I will leave a comment as a reminder. So if you are interested in this, you can look this up in Google. Those are just some additional steps you have to do, but it shouldn't be too complicated. And then we also want to create a function that gets the card from the database. You can put it above or below, it doesn't matter. Export async function, get card. Again, it doesn't take any arguments. Here we want to get the card ID out of the cookie because we are still working with anonymous cards. So let's create a const local card ID, cookies.get this time. And we of course pass the same cookie name as a string. And out of this we can get the value. This can be undefined because the cookie might not exist. This is why it adds the save card operator. And below we create a const card equals. We can only fetch the card if we have the local card ID, so if it is defined. So we write local card ID question mark to use the ternary operator. If the local card ID is defined, we want to assign the card to a weight, make our database operation. So prisma.card.find unique to find the card by its ID. Then we add this where clause, where ID colon is the same as the local card idea from the cookie. And then we can do something really cool. So by default, the card doesn't contain the card items, right? Because we don't store them as an array in the card model. They are in a separate collection. Similarly, the card items don't store the product information. The products are also in their own collection. 
And this is really important because if we update the information of a product, for example the price or the description, then we also want these changes to be reflected in the card items and in the card, right? We don't want any stale data in our card because this would be a terrible user experience. Instead we fetch this product information only when we need it. But when we make our query here, we can tell Prisma to put the card item information into the cards that we fetch from the database and put the product information into the card items. And it works like this. After where we put a comma and then we add include colon curly braces. Then in here we have items which refers to the items field here in the cards model. Now we could write colon true. This way we would put the card items into the card that we fetch from the database. But remember that the card items don't contain the product information yet, only the product idea. To go one level deeper, we don't pass true. Instead, we pass another block of curly braces. And in here, we can write include again to include the product information into the card items. So again, include colon. And in here, we have the product. And then we set this to true. This might look a bit complicated at first, but auto completion helps you here. So just press control space or command space and you will see what you can include and what operators you can use. But again, this way we don't only fetch the card with the ID and the timestamp, we also put the card item information in there and we put the product information into the card items. So now we have our full card with all the latest product information inside. But we are using the ternary operator here, so we also need a colon afterwards. Let's put it here. If the local card ID is missing, we want to return null here, because then we can't fetch a card. So below we check if exclamation mark card, if it's null, then we want to return null from this function. And if the card exists, we want to return the card. But I don't only want to return the card, I also want to return some additional meta information. I want to return how many items there are in the card right now and what's the current subtotal of all the prices combined. So we don't just return the card, we return a block of curly braces to create a new JavaScript object. In here we first of all spread the card to put all the card information in there. And then we add additional fields. One is the size. And for this we have to do a little calculation because we can't just use card.length because we don't store a separate card item for each item we put into our card. Instead, we always have a product and a quantity. So we have to calculate the size. We can do this with card.items.reduce. Reduce is just a JavaScript function. And this takes another function as an argument where we get the accumulated value and the next item in the list. And then we can calculate the total quantity. For this, we take ACC, but this is just a naming convention. You can name this anything you want. Plus item.quantity. So it goes through each element in our array and it adds the quantity to the accumulated value so that we get the total quantity at the end. And as the second argument, after a comma, we have to pass the starting value, I think, which is zero. Okay, so again, reduce is just a normal JavaScript function that you can use for stuff like this. And then we also want to add the subtotal, for which again we use the reduce function. Card.items.reduce. Again, we get the accumulated value and the next item. And then we want to make our calculation. ACZ plus item.quantity. And we want to multiply this with the price of the product, right? to get the total price, item.product.price. And again, comma, and zero as the starting value. Now it would be cool if we had a type for this object because we want to return an empty card from create card as well with the same structure. And it's always good to set up a type so that we get auto completion and we know what fields belong in there, right? We can create the type above. We could also put it in another file, but it's closely connected to these functions, so I think it makes sense to put them here. We don't use an interface, we use a type, because again I want to combine two types with an intersection, and I'm going to call it shopping cart. Shopping cart, and not just cart, because cart is already the name of the cart model in the database. 
we want to use this card and combine it with the size and the subtotal that we add down here. So we add an ampersand sign to create this intersection type and then a block of curly braces and then here we put size of type number and subtotal of type number. There is just one problem. This card type here only contains the data that is in the card model, the ID and the timestamps. It doesn't contain the card item or product information. And by default, Prisma doesn't give us this populated type. We have card item, but this is not populated with the product information, but we can create these types ourselves and Prisma has convenience functions that we can use for that. So above the shopping cart type, we export another type and we export them so that we can use them in different files later. Let's call it cart with products because that's a cart with all the product information in there. And then we can use Prisma with an uppercase P. We have to import this dot cart get payload. And then we add a pair of angle brackets like this. And between the angle brackets, we put a block of curly braces. And then we add the same include query that we also have down here. And we paste them between these curly braces. And this creates this type from this query. So now we have a card with all the populated items in there that contain the product information. And then we can use this down here as the type for our shopping cart. And now we have a shopping cart with all the data inside it and this additional size and subtotal value. And this is the same structure of the object we return here. So let's add an explicit return type to get card. This is just a good convention so that you make sure that you always return the correct object. So after get card, we write colon. And again, we have to wrap this into a promise because this is an async function. And we return a shopping cart or null if the cookie is missing. And then as I said, we also want to return an empty shopping cart from create card so that we can work with it. So we add a return type here as well. Again, a promise of type shopping cart. And we get an error because we are not returning anything yet. We will do that below. After we set the cookie, we return an object. And now since we define this return type, we get auto completion here, which is really useful. The card information, so the ID of the card and the timestamps are contained in this new card object, right? So we spread this in here, just like we did for the other card above. For the size, we simply pass zero because the new card is empty and for subtotal as well, just so that we have a card to work with in our app. But this still complains because the data of this card is empty. So for items, we just add an empty array. Okay, let's format and save this. And then we can use these functions in our server action file in increment product quantity. Here we want to fetch the card from the database so that we can modify it. So we create a const card equals await get card, which is the new function we just created. But if we get back null here, we want to create a new card because a card might not exist yet. If we open the website, we don't create a card immediately. We only create it when we actually modify the card so that we don't bloat our database with empty anonymous cards. So we add two question marks, which means that the right side will be executed if get card returns null or undefined. Then we want to await create card. And this also gives us a new card back, right? Just an empty card. When we reformat this file, Prettya automatically adds parentheses around these cards, but I think they should not be necessary. The logic should be the same. This is probably just for readability. So now we have our card and when we click our add to cart button, we either want to add this product to the cart if it doesn't exist or if it's already in the cart, we want to increase the quantity. So we check if the article is already in the cart. Let's create a const article in cart equals. And then we want to find this item in cart.items. So we can use the find function, which again is just a normal JavaScript function. This passes us each item in this array. And then we can check if an item with this product ID is already in the cart. So we check item dot product ID, which remember is part of the schema. So each card item contains the product ID that it references. If this product ID is the same 
as the product ID that we pass to this increment quantity function, then we know that this item is already in the cart. And then we want to increase its quantity. If not, we want to put a newer item into the cart. So below we check if article in cart, we want to update the quantity of the existing cart item. So we call await prisma, which again we have to import dot cart item dot update to which as usual we pass curly braces. Here we first have to tell Prisma which item we want to update with this where key, to which again we pass curly braces, and in here we have the idea that we compare to an article and cart dot idea, because this is the one we want to update, right? Comma and as the second value we pass the data of this update. As usual we get auto completion here. We want to update the quantity. Again, curly braces, and then we have this increment value that we can use. We want to increment this by one. Now we could also update it with the current quantity plus one. This would have the same effect. However, I think increment avoids race conditions if you update it from multiple places. But this shouldn't make any difference here because no user will update their card from many different places at once, right? But if we have this increment function available, then we might as well use it. Okay, so we increment the product quantity of the existing card in the else block. If the item is not in the card yet, then we want to create a new card item. So we call await prisma.cardItem.create this time. And here we only have to pass the data. We want to set the card ID to the ID of the cards that we are fetched. Again, the card ID is part of our card item model here, so that we know which card this item belongs to. So we set the card ID. Then we want to set the product ID of the product we are adding. Now, instead of writing product ID, colon product ID, we can also use the short syntax if the value has the same name as the key. And we want to set the quantity to one. But there's one more thing we want to do here. After this operation is done, we want to refresh the screen so that we see the latest number of items in our cart in the navbar later, for example. But we are working mostly with server components, so we don't have any state in there that we can update. Instead, we can refresh the whole screen, basically. And the way this works in server actions is you call revalidate path with the path that you want to refresh, which will fetch the latest data. To it, we pass a string of the path we want to update. We want to update slash products slash scrap records and the idea like this. This is the path of the product page, right? We have app products and ID and scrap records. And this is the path we want to refresh. Notice that this string contains the path and not the URL. So we put the same ID between scrap records in here as we also have in the folder name because this is not the actual URL, this is the path it has in our file structure. And later when we use this server action, this line here will take care that the screen refreshes with the latest data. And we want to call this server action in our add to cart button, right? Now normally we could just import this server action here and use it in here. This works even when this is a client component. However, there is currently a bug that makes this approach not work with next off that we will later implement. Later, we will not only have the anonymous card, right? We will also fetch the current user session when we get the card from the database. And this currently doesn't work in server components that you import directly into client components. This is a bug. They will eventually fix this. But for us right now, this means that we can't import our server action right here in this add to card button component. But what we can do instead is we can import it in the server component, so the page itself, and then we can pass the server action as a prop to the add to cart button. So we just pass it as another argument, just like the product ID. So let's do it like this. Let's add another argument to the props, which we give the same name as the server function we just set up. Increment product quantity. The name doesn't have to match, but it makes sense because this is what we expect, right? So this is a function that takes in the product ID and it doesn't return anything. 
So we write it like this. Colon product ID of type string and the return value of the function is a promise of type void. Promise again because it's an async function. Then we add this function down here where we destructure the props and then we want to call this when we click the button, right? So inside this onClick block. Now the documentation about server actions state that when you call them from a client component, you should wrap them into a use transition. Use transition is a relatively newer React hook, which you can look up if you want, but they don't really explain in the documentation why we have to use that here. It's not really clear. They just explain that we have to use it. I spend a lot of time trying to figure out why, because this is not really explained anywhere yet at the moment. But I eventually got an answer on Twitter. So I asked here, and Tim is part of the Next.js team, so he should know. Start transition bounds the error that happened in the transition to the component where you call use transition. This ensures that server actions, when called manually, do not crash the entire page. So in a nutshell, this means that we have to wrap this into a start transition so that any error that happens in the server action is forwarded to our own error page, which I think we haven't set up yet, but we will do this later. In other words, the error is handled properly and doesn't crash our app. And also, when we use start transition, we get this loading state here that we can use to show a loading indicator. So let's go back into our project and implement this. So we need this use transition hook that we can initialize here at the top. So const, and it returns a tuple just like use state. The first value is usually called is pending, which is true while this transition is running. And the second argument is usually called start transition. You can give this any name you want, but those are naming conventions. And then we initialize this with this use transition hook, which is a React import. Normally the purpose of use transition is to not block the UI when we do a state updates. But this doesn't really have anything to do with our server actions here. Again, in our case, this use transition is necessary because we call a server action from a client component and this takes care of handling the error and the loading state properly. This is what I showed you a moment ago. But I also want to create a second state when our operation was successful. We want to show a little message, right? So we create another tuple that contains success and set success. And we assign this to a use state. Not use transition this time, but use state. Make sure that it adds the correct import and we initialize use state with false, which automatically infers this as a boolean. And then in the onclick handler of our button, first of all, we want to set success back to false to hide the success message when we click the add to cart button again. Then we want to call the server action and again we have to wrap this into a start transition, which is this part that we get here. This is a function that takes another function as argument. In here we write async and add another arrow function like this. Async because we want to await our increment product quantity function, which is an async function. So in here we call await increment product quantity and pass the ID of the product. So this is our server action that we pass to the client component. And then after this is done, we want to set success to true to show the success message. This is all happening inside start transition. Okay, so now we have a loading state through is pending and we have a success state from our use state. Now let's render a loading spinner and a success message in the UI when these values are true. We do this below the button, but still inside the diff. And we already styled this diff to a flex box that centers the items. So this should be aligned correctly. And here we put an expression with curly braces. And first we check if is pending is true. Then we want to render a loading indicator, which again we do with a span that gets a self closing tag. And for the class name, we use daisy UI classes as we did earlier loading to turn this into a loading indicator and loading spinner yeah, to make it a loading spinner and we can set the size with loading minus md and then another one below this time we want to check if success is true to show the success message 
but success will actually be truer before we revalidated the path. So before we reloaded the page, which remember we do in our server action. We call revalidate path here and this happens after the server action has finished. However, this is pending value will be true until the revalidation finished. So what we do is we combine these two values down here. We check that is pending is back to false with exclamation mark is pending and success is true. Only then we want to render the success message, which again we put into a span. It will say add it to cart. You can add any text you want. And we set the class name to a text success, which again is a daisy UI class that just gives us a green color. Okay, and now we only have to pass our server action from our page to our add to cart button. And one more time to recap, normally we can import server actions in client components, this is not a problem, but here we have to pass it as an argument because there's currently a little bug that happens when we later use next off to get the locked in user session. This is why we pass the server action as an argument instead. So to add to cart button, we have to pass increment product quantity here, which we import from the actions file. And then we should be all set up to try this out. Let's refresh the page just to make sure. When we click the add to cart button, we should see a loading spinner for a short moment. And then we should see a success message, right? Add to cart, there's the loading spinner, add it to cart. Now there was a little glitch when the page reloaded, but this glitch only happens in development because it's reloading the font for some reason. But in production there is no glitch, so it doesn't look as if we just refresh the page. Instead the image and the text will just stay in place and only the parts that have to be updated will refresh with the latest data, but there is no glitch in the UI. It will look as if we just updated some state. And now we should see this item in our database, right? Let's look in the cart items collection and refresh this. And there is now one product in here with a quantity of one. And it also contains the ID of the cart where this is added to. So 901 were the last digits and it's the same idea that the cart in the cart collection has. Let's try adding the same item again and see if we increase the quantity instead of adding a new entry here. So again, we click this button, we see our loading spinner and let's refresh the database, quantity tour, perfect. There should also now be a cookie set in our browser with the same card idea. So this ends with 901, let's remember this. Open the Chrome DevTools with F12 and we can see the cookies here in the application tab. We can click here on cookies and on localhost and there's the local card ID that contains our current card ID. And this cookie will still be there when we close the page and open it again. And this allows us to fetch our anonymous card even if we are not logged in. So this is really professional. This is also how big e-commerce websites actually do it. They store the identifier for the card in a cookie. If we delete this cookie and add another item to the card, then it should create a new card, right? Because then the identifier for the card is missing. Let's try this out. Let's delete this cookie just with the delete button. And let me refresh the page just to be sure that the changes are applied and click add to cart again. And then in our database, we should see a new cart. And there it is. And now we have a cookie for this cart ID instead. Now later, I will also explain to you how you can delete cards automatically if they haven't been updated for a while so that we don't accumulate a lot of abandoned cards in our database, right? But for now, let's ignore this. Now, of course, we could also get rid of this loading state here and let the database operation run in the background. But for something like a shopping cart, it's actually better to have a loading spinner and then a success message so that the user has a confirmation that the item was successfully added to the cart. Because if they click add to cart and then navigate away and then the item wasn't actually added to the cart for some reason, maybe it threw an error, maybe there was some other problem, then it's a bad user experience if they don't actually see the item in the cart. This is why for an e-commerce app, it's actually better if there's a loading spinner and a success message after the operation has finished. And this is also how Amazon does it, by the way. Let's also add another item just to see that this works as well. A green bottle, for example. Again, add to cart, add it. Let's 
check the card items collection. And now we have one of these bottles in here, which should be this one. This has the product ID 588A, which should also be the ID of the bottle here, yeah. B88A. Now at first I was worried about race conditions when we click this button multiple times in a row, because this also creates a new card when we don't have one yet, right? And we want to avoid accidentally creating multiple cards because we hammer this button multiple times in a row. But when you try this out, you will actually notice that these server actions are executed in succession. So even if we click the add to cart button multiple times, it will first execute the first server action. And after this has finished, it will execute the second one, which then increments the quantity. So there is no race condition. At least this is how it works in the moment. Again, server actions are in alpha. Maybe they are changing this behavior in the future. But at least for now, this works exactly like it should work. Let's actually try this out as well. Let's delete our cards for a moment. We can just delete the whole collection. It will be recreated when we create a new card. And let's do the same for the card items. I'm gonna refresh the page. And then I click add to cart fast two times in a row and it should create only one cart and then increment the quantity of the existing item to two. So click, click two times. Let's check our database. Let's refresh this. So there should be one cart and one cart item with a quantity of two. So this worked. There is no race condition and our app works fine. Okay, cool. Later we will add our card page where we can change the quantity of the existing items. So then we will use another server action. But for now, let's add the navbar and the footer to our page so that we can navigate between our different pages and also show our card and navigate to our card later. Okay, before we set up our navbar, I want to make one more little change to our schema file. I want to add on delete cascade, not only to the product, but also to the card here in the card item model. So again, comma, on delete, colon, cascade, with the spelling, because now when we delete a card, all the corresponding card items will be deleted as well, which I think makes sense. All right, and then we wanna set up the navbar that we put at the top of our page so that we can navigate between different pages and we don't have to type in the URL all the time. We could put the navbar into the components folder, but since we use it throughout our whole app, I like to put it directly into the app folder here. In here we create a new folder called navbar, because we need multiple files in there. And the first file we put in there is navbar.tsx. Of course we use the navbar provided by Tailwind UI. You can find it in the documentation. There are different variations. You can find the code of it. But the one we are building here combines different elements of this page into one. We use the shopping cart item, we use the search box. So let's go back into our project and export a default function called navbar. Okay, and in the return statement, let's start building the UI of this navbar. We start with a div, which we give a background color with the class bg minus base minus 100. Before we continue, let's save this and then put it in the UI. And we want the snuff bar to be visible on all pages throughout our website. So we put this in the root layout. It's part of the HTML body, but not part of the main tag. So above the main tag, we just render our snuff bar and save it. Let's see if we can already see something in the UI. Not yet, but we will see something when we put content in here. Into this outer div, we put another div to which again we add some class names. So the first one is navbar, which is coming from this UI and this adds some CSS attributes to style this like a navbar. Then I want to give this navbar the same max width as the content of our pages so that the elements of the navbar don't stretch out throughout the whole screen. So again we use max w7xl. That's also the value that we used here in our layout for the main container. We use the same one here. And this is why I wrapped this into this outer div which applies the background color of the navbar 
because I want the background color to take up the full width, but the contents of the navbar be constrained within this max width here. And to render this on the screen, we add the margin auto. Then we make this navbar a flex column. The flex class is not necessary because that's already included in the navbar here. Flex column means the elements will be aligned below each other, but we only want this to be the case on small screens. So we add a breakpoint here, SM, so on small screens and higher. The only value below SM is XS. So flex call will be applied on XS screens, so on very small screens, and on slightly larger screens, SM. And larger, we want to set this to a flex row, so the elements are aligned horizontally. And then we also add a gap of 2 to get some space between the items. You will see how this looks in a moment after we added items to our navbar. So the first item I want to put in the navbar is the logo and the name of the website, which we wrap into another div, which we give the class name flex1. This adds this flex110% attribute, which defines how these items stretch over the available space of the navbar. Then in here we put a next link so that we can click this item and navigate to the front page. So we set the href to just slash as a string to get to the home page. And inside this link, we put a next image that will contain the logo of the website. Again, make sure the import is correct. We set the SRZ to the logo, which I already included in the starting project. If you are not using the starting project, then you can get the logo out of the project on GitHub. So in SRZ should be an assets folder and in here is the logo, which I prepared. We have to import this here. So import logo from add, which is the root folder. In here is the assets folder. And in there is logo.png. That's what we want to use for the image source. And then we want to resize this to 40 pixels times 40 pixels. And we set the alt text to Flowmason logo. And then we close this. Okay, let's save this and see how this looks. So now we see our navbar with this logo in there. And I also want to put some text next to this logo, so still inside the link, but below the image. We write Flomazon. But I want to style this properly, so we add some class names directly to the link. We make this a button, or rather we style this as a button, it's still a link. Button Ghost gives this a certain styling that looks like this, looks pretty cool. We make all the text in here larger with text XL, but the button automatically makes this all uppercase. We can revert this with normal minus case. And those are all Tailwind and Daisy UI classes. So now we have this link here with the logo and the name. And when we click this, we get to the front page. Really cool. Okay, below this div here, so the flex one div, we put another div, which will contain the search field and the shopping cart button, but those will be aligned on the right side, whereas the logo is aligned on the left side. So Flex1 basically makes this part here grow to all the available space, and it pushes these elements that we put into this div to the right side. To this div below, we add the class names Flex None and gap 2 as well to get some spacing in here. Then in here we want to put a search field for which we use a form. So we put a form in here and we will use a server action to execute the search again. Into this form we pass a div with the class name form control and again I'm getting these class names from the DAISY UI documentation. We close this div and add an input field in here, which gets a self-closing tag as usual. We give this input the name search query. 
we set the placeholder to search and we style this like we did earlier on the add product page. We make this an input with the input border styling. Then I want this input field to take up the full available width with W minus full, but the width will still be constrained by the text that wrap this input field. And then I also want to set a min width of 200 pixels so that we can't shrink the input field to a very tiny size where we can't use it anymore. And again, we can use an arbitrary pixel value like this. And when we save this, we see our input field. And the snuff bar should now also be responsive, right? So at a certain size, this should move below it and it works, but the input field doesn't get too small. At a certain size, it will just say, no, I don't want to shrink any further. And this happens at 100 pixels. And to execute the search, we will use a server action again. And since this file is not a client component, we can just declare the server action directly in here. So we create an async function called search products. And the same as on the add product page, this takes form data. And at the top of this function, we add the use server directive. Then we want to get the search query out of the form data. So we create a const search query, and we have done this before. We call form data.get, pass the name of this input field, which is search query. And then we call to a string to turn this into a string. And then below we check if search query has a value because we only want to execute a search if there's actually something typed into the input field. Then we call redirect, which we import from next navigation. Make sure the import is correct. And we want to navigate to the search page, which we haven't set up yet, but we do this later. The URL will be a slash search and we will pass the search query as a URL query param. So we add a question mark, query equals, without a space, and then we append the search query value. The cool thing is that redirect also works in uh, server components and server actions. So we can execute this in here, and it doesn't require any JavaScript. So our search will work even if JavaScript is disabled, which is always nice to have. And to execute this when we submit our form, we do the same as we did earlier. We set the action to the name of our server action, search products. Now, if you are experienced with HTML, then you might think we could also just pass the URL that we want to navigate to, to the form action, instead of doing this detour through the server action. So we could just put this part here directly down here and remove the whole server action altogether. However, this would reload the page, which is a very jarring user experience. With our approach here, we are not reloading the page. We have this very soft navigation where the navbar and everything stays in place. And this just looks and feels better than using the normal URL action. Okay, but the button that shows the shopping cart will have to be a client component because it shows a pop-up menu. And in order to show and close this pop-up menu, we need JavaScript. We don't get around this. So to not make this whole navbar a client component, we put this into a separate file and we put this into the same navbar folder here. Let's call it shopping cart button and export a component with the same name as usual. Now to this shopping cart button, we will pass the cart itself. So the shopping cart that contains the data of the cart. But we will fetch the card in our navbar because this way we can fetch it server side and we don't have to use state or anything like that. We just pass it to our client component here. So at the top, we create an interface, shopping cart button props, which will contain the card, which is of type shopping cart. That's the type we created earlier with all the card item and product information inside the card. So we import this from the lib folder 
but this can also be null because we might not have created a card yet. Okay, and then we pass this card to the component. So here, shopping cart, button props, and we destructure the card out of there. And then we return some UI here. The outer element is a diff, which we give the class names drop down and drop down end, which again are daisy UI classes. For now, let's save this and let's put this shopping cart button into our navbar. So first we have to fetch the shopping cart, right? We can do this right here because this is a server component, but we have to make this an async function. Then we can create a const cart and call await get cart from our lib folder. And now we have the cart data and we can pass it to our shopping cart button. We put the shopping cart button here right below the form opening angle bracket shopping cart button and it expects the cart which we already fetched. Then let's finish the shopping cart button. So back into this component and most of the markup here is coming from the daisy UI documentation. I just copy this for the most part. In here we put a label which we give the tab index zero. The tab index is necessary so that we can use tab to navigate between items, which is necessary for accessibility. We style this with btn ghost and btn circle, which makes this round, yeah, and the normal btn class, which is the base button styling. We close this label tag, and then we wrap this into another div to which we add the class name indicator because this way we can have a little badge on our cart button that shows the current number of items in the cart. Then in here we copy paste the same cart icon that we also use on the add to cart button here. So you can either copy paste it from there or copy paste it from the github repository. When we save this we already see this cart icon here and to add some Number to this indicator here, we go below the SVG, but still inside this div, and add another span, which contains the number that we want to put in there. So we add an expression with curly braces. What do we want to put in here? We want to put the card size in there, which is part of the shopping cart type, right? So when we fetch a card, we return the size that we calculated earlier. And we want to display the size here. If this value is undefined because a card doesn't exist yet, then we want to fall back to zero. And when we save this, it's not styled properly yet. We have to add the class name to the span as well. The first one is batch, then batch sm for the size, and indicator minus item. Now when we save this, this is styled properly. And looks really cool, doesn't it? And this always reflects the actual number of items in our card. So when we uh, add another item, this will switch to a three after this has finished loading. And number three. But we also want to show a drop down menu when we click this item. So we go below this label here and add another diff. Again, this diff gets this tab index zero value and some class names to style this. The drop down will be styled like a card. Then we have drop down content. And again, you can find instructions on how to style these elements properly in the daisy UI documentation. Then we add card compact, which adds some size styling. We need a margin top. We need a width which we set to w minus 52. This is just the width of this drop-down menu. We need a background color with BG base 100, and we can add a drop shadow with the shadow class. And one more class, Z minus 30. This sets the Z index. 
this takes care that this drop-down menu is not hidden behind other elements. So it's on the foreground. Okay, then we go inside this div and put the contents of this drop-down menu in here. Again, we need another div. This is just unfortunately how HTML works. It's div within divs within divs. We style this with the card body class. And in here again, I want to show the size of the card and also the subtotal. So the total dollar amount of our items combined right now. So inside this div, we put a span with the class names text LG for the text size and font bold. And this will say number of items. So we add an expression and then items behind. And in this expression, we want to show the card size again or fall back to zero if we don't have a card yet. And when we click our button here, we already see our drop down menu. Now let's add the subtotal below as another span, which we give the class name text info. This changes the text color. And in here we write subtotal colon. And then we want to show the price, which we want to format. Remember for this, we have this format price function that we created earlier. To this, we want to pass card.subtotal, which again, we calculate when we return the card. Again, this might be undefined. In this case, we want to fall back to zero again. Okay, save this. Now we have this value in here as well, and it's actually the correct value. So this is correctly calculated. One more thing, I also want to have a button in here that brings us to the card page where we can then modify our card, right? So below the subtotal span, we put another div with the class name card actions. This is for buttons that we put into this menu, but we don't use a button. We use a next link again because we are linking to another URL. But this import here is wrong. We don't want to import it from this dist folder, we want to import it from next slash link. Sometimes auto import doesn't work for whatever reason, but the curly braces are wrong. We have to remove them because this is the default export. Okay, so this link will lead us to slash card. Again, we haven't set up this page yet, but we will do so later. We style this link like a button with BTN, a primary button with BTN primary. And to take up the full width, we add BTN block. And this button will say view card. So now we have this button here that brings us to the card page, which doesn't exist yet. Now, since this page doesn't exist, this drop down menu closes when this page is loaded for some reason. But if we just for a moment change this to a page that does exist and click this button again, then you can see that the drop down does not close automatically. We actually have to handle this ourselves. This is why we need JavaScript. Unfortunately, we can't close this drop down menu without JavaScript. So make sure you set the href back to slash card. And then we add another prop to the link. We want to set the on click handler here and we want to call close drop down. And we put this function here above the return statement. So we create a function that we give the same name. And what we want to do is we want to remove the focus from this button here because this is what opens this drop down menu. The way we do this is we get the currently focused element like this document.activeElement and you have to do this with these daisy UI elements. You have to handle closing these drop down menus yourself. Then we have to cast this to an HTML element. Then we have to check if we found an element. We want to remove the focus which we do with lm.blur. Now when we save this, we will get an error because onClick requires this to be a client component because onClick needs JavaScript. 
So at the top, we make this whole shopping cart button a client component, save this, and then it should work. Again, just for testing purposes, I let this link us to the home page, but I set this back to the cart page in a moment. And now when we click this button, we get to the home page and the drop-down menu closes. Okay, revert this back. Okay, our navbar is finished. This is really cool because now we see the actual shopping cart data in here. Next, we want to set up the cart page where this links us to. But before we do this, I also want to add a simple footer to our website just so that it looks more complete. So let's put the footer into the app folder as well because it wraps the whole website. Footer.tsx and this time I'm just gonna copy paste this whole thing because this is just some dummy markup. I actually copied this right from the Daisy UI documentation. And I will put a link to this file in the description below as well so you can copy paste it from there. But again, this is just some placeholder. And then we put this into our root layout. Below the main content, we render the footer here, save this, and there's our beautiful professional footer that's also responsive, by the way. This looks really like right out of Amazon.com. Okay. There's one more bug I want to mention right now. Again, these server actions are still in alpha, so they have some bugs. We have to wait until they are fixed. Right now, while a server action is running, we can actually not navigate to another page over a link. To try this out for a moment, I want to add a delay to our increment quantity action. Again, I will remove this in a moment. So here I await a new promise. And I'm trying to remember the syntax of this. You don't have to write this. This is just to show you something. I just want to create an artificial delay, which we can do by awaiting a timeout. So let's say we delay this for three seconds, just for testing purposes. Now, when I click this add to cart button, this will take over three seconds to finish. And while this is loading, we can actually not navigate to the front page over this link. So this is loading and I click this link and nothing happens. But this should work. We only navigate to the front page after this has finished. But this is a bug in server actions right now. So we just have to ignore this for the moment. There are discussions about this on GitHub and I'm sure they will fix this eventually. But just that you know that this bug exists. So I want to remove this promise here again. And then we want to set up our cart page. All right, let's set up our cart page. So we navigate to a slash cart when we click our view cart button here. This means we need a folder in our app folder with this name cart. And in here we put a page.tsx. And then we export a default async function and we call it cart page. Then we return the UI. We wrap this whole page into a div. And in here we put a headline that says shopping cart or your cart or whatever you want to put in here. And we style this. We set the text to a 3XL. We make it bold and add some margin bottom. Let's see how this looks. View cart. And there's the title. We can also add some metadata to this page. As usual, by exporting a const metadata, static metadata here is enough. We don't need dynamic metadata. And we set the title to your cart dash flowmason. And this changes the title here in the tab. Okay, so the cart is a server component, meaning that we can fetch data in here. We want to fetch the card so that we can show it on the screen, right? Await get card from our lib folder. And then I want to list all the card items as a vertical list here on this page with the price and the subtotal and the image and everything. So here we put an expression. We take card.items, which remember contains also the product information because we return our populated shopping cart. So all the data is contained in this items field. And then we want to map each card item 
into a UI element. This UI element will also contain the server action, which allows us to change the quantity of an existing card item. So for organization, let's put this into a separate file. And we can collocate this with the card page here. Let's call it card entry.tsx. Again, this will be a client component because we need JavaScript in here. And then we export a default function with the same name. Now to this component, I want to pass a single card item. So one of these card item entries here, but I want the product information to be inside it, right? This is already taken care of by returning the shopping cart here from the get card function, but we don't yet have a type that we can use for this argument. So let's go back into the card file in our lib folder again, where we created this card ref products type. We also want the type only for this part here, for a single item that contains the product information. So let's add a second type below that we create in the same way. We export a type that we call card item with product. Again, we create it with Prisma. This time card item get payload, not card get payload, but card item. Then again, angle brackets, curly braces. And in here we put the query that is required to populate a card item, which is include colon, and we even get auto completion. Product colon true. So we want one card item with the product information inside it. Okay, we save this, we export this type, and then we can use it in our card entry here. We create an interface for the props as usual, card entry props. We need one card item, which is of type card item with product that we just created. So this is one card item with the quantity, but also the populated product. Then we add this prop down here, card entry props, and we destructure the card item out of it. And then we can show this card item in the UI. So let's return a div in which we put another div, because below the card entry, we also want to put a divider, which is just a vertical line. So below this inner div, we put another div with a self-closing tag that gets the class name divider, which again is coming from Daisy UI. And above in this div, we put the actual product information. So this div here at the top needs some classes, flex, Flex wrap, which is required for responsiveness. So if there's not enough room, then the elements will automatically move below each other. We want to center the items and give it a gap of three. Then in here, we put the product image as usual as the next image. We set the SRZ to the image of the product, but we don't want to write card item dot product dot all the time. So we can destructure this card item further with colon, curly braces, and we care about the product and the quantity. That's the data we need in here. And then down here in the image source, we can just write product dot image URL. For the alt text, we use the product name again. We set the width and the height to 200 pixels. And we make the corners of this image rounded with rounded LG. Then we close this. Before we continue, let's save this and add it to our map function here. So we map each card item to one of these card entries to which we have to pass the card item of this map function. And again, since this is a list, we also have to add a key with a unique identifier. For this, we can use the ID or the product ID shouldn't matter. 
And then we already see our product here. Really cool. Let's finish the card entry layout and add the remaining information. So below the image we put another div. Then we add a link here because the name of the product will also be a link to the product detail page. But auto import didn't work, so we have to import this manually. Import link from next slash link. We set the href of this link to slash products slash and the product idea because this brings us to the detail page and I want to set the class name to font bold and then this link will just contain the product name and there it is right below this link I want to render the price of the product of a single item so in the diff we write price color again we use our format price function to which we pass product.price, there it is, that's the price for a single green bottle. Then below this div I also want to show the total price, so the price of one item multiplied by the quantity. So we add another div here with the class names flex, item center and gap tour. And here we write total column. And again, we want to format the price, but this time it's product.price multiplied by the quantity. It's not product.quantity, it's just quantity because that's part of the card item. So the total price is 1596, which is also shown in our card dropdown. Okay, and I want to show the current quantity between these two diffs here, but I also want to add a drop down menu with which we can change the quantity. So we go below the price, but above the total. And here we add another diff, but we are almost done. Again, we need some class names. We need some vertical margin, MY1. We make this a flex box with item center and a gap of two. Okay, then this will say quantity column, and in here we put a select, which creates a drop down menu in HTML. Then we need options for this drop down menu. I want to have the numbers 1 to 99 in there so that we can change the quantity. For this, we need an array that contains the numbers 1 to 99. We create this array above the return statement. We create a const quantity options. This will be of type JSX element, but an array of JSX elements. And we initialize this with an empty array. Why JSX element? Because we want to put these option tags in there, which are HTML elements, and we can put them into a JSX array. But we want to do so in a loop that goes from 1 to 99. So we write for and create a normal for loop let i equals 1, that's the number we start with, i less than or equal to 99, semicolon, i++, plus plus. this is just a normal for loop in JavaScript. And for each iteration, we want to take our quantity options and push a new element in here. As I already said, we want to put such an option tag in there. This option tag contains a text with the number, so we just render i in here, so number 1 to 99. And then we also have to set the value of this option tag to the same number. And since this is an array, we also have to set a key for which again we use i. So this loop here creates a list of these option tags from number 1 to 99. That's all this does. And now we can render these options in our select tag here. So between the opening and the closing tag, we put an expression and we want to render our quantity options here. And this is how it looks. It's not styled properly yet. So let's do that next. We add class names to the select tag. Select, which is a daisy UI class. Select bordered. 
W full and a max width of 80 pixels. This way this input field stays responsive and it can shrink, but it will not be bigger than 80 pixels because that's enough. And this is how it looks. We can also set the default value to the current quantity because when we open the page, we don't want this to show one if we have four green bottles in our card, right? So we can add the default value prop and we simply set this to the quantity of this current card item. So now when we save this and refresh the page, this shows four. And now when we change the quantity by selecting a different one, we want to execute a server action that changes the quantity of this item in the database. So we add the on change prop here, which will be called whenever we select something in this dropdown. And here we get past this E argument, which is the dropdown menu itself. So we add a function body here, then we can get this value out of the dropdown menu and call our server action. And JavaScript is required to execute on change. This doesn't work in the server component, unfortunately. This is why we have to make this a client component. But as we already learned, we can still call server actions in client components. So let's set up this new server action next. Again, we pull it into the same folder. Again, we call it actions.ts, just like we did for the increment product quantity action. Just that this function here will allow us to set an arbitrary quantity and it will also revalidate a different path. It will revalidate this card page to update it. But besides of that, we are not doing anything new in here. So we make this file a server action file. Then we export an async function that we call set product quantity to which we pass the product ID but also the quantity in form of a number. So this will look very similar to the other actions file we already have, just that here we only needed the product ID because we always incremented by one, but we also need the card in this other file and create one if it doesn't exist yet. So we copy this line here, paste it here. We have to import these functions from the lib folder. Again, we want to check if this article is already in the card. So let's copy this line here as well put it here and then we want to do one of three things. If we set the quantity to zero, we want to remove this item from the card completely. If we set a positive value and the article is already in the card, then we want to update this item with the new quantity. And if the item is not in the card, then we want to create a new one. Now with our current UI, this third case is not actually possible because we can't set the quantity if the item is not in the card already, but maybe you want to change the UI later. So we will take care of this possibility as well. So we check if quantity that we pass to this function is equal to zero. Then we want to check if the article is in the card, only then we can delete it, right? Then we call prisma dot card item dot delete. We want to delete the item where just follow along. The idea is equal to the article and card idea that we just found. We want to delete this card item. Else, if the quantity is not zero, but a positive number, then again, we want to check if the article is already in the card. In this case, we call await prisma.cardItem.update to change the quantity. We want to update the same item as we used up here with the article and card ID, so we can reuse the same WHERE clause. But this time we also want to set the data. We want to pass the new quantity. And again, since the field and the variable name are the same, we can use the short syntax here. Okay, and then we add an else block to this inner if here. So if article and card is not defined, if we don't already have this item in the card, then we want to await prisma.cardItem.create and we set the data like this. 
This will look similar to how we created the card item here. So we can actually copy paste this over. The data is the card idea, the product idea, but we don't want to set the quantity to one. We want to set it to the quantity value that we pass to this function. And at the end of our set product quantity function, out of this outer if block here, we want to revalidate the page again, right? With revalidate path. This time we want to revalidate slash card, which again refreshes the page and fetches the latest data. And now we want to call this server action in our card entry file. But remember, this is a client component and because of this one bug, we can't import a server action directly in the client component because this will not work with next off later. So again, we have to import a server action in the page, which is a server component, and then pass it to the card entry. But we haven't added the arguments to the card entry yet. So over into the card entry again, into the card entry props. Here we expect the Z product quantity here it's a difficult word function which is the server action and again it gets the same signature as the server action we just set up it takes the product idea in form of a string and the quantity in form of a number oops and it returns a promise of type void and then we add it down here as well But again, we import the server action in our page and pass it to the component. So let's go into the card entry tag here, pass set product quantity for which we import our new server action. Okay, we save this, go back into the card entry, down to our onChange function here. First of all, we want to get the selection out of this field here which we can do the following way. We create a variable. I'm going to call it new quantity equals pass int because this contains a string and we want to pass this into a number. And the value is contained in this year value that we get here. Dot current target dot value. And there is the selection of this dropdown field. And then we want to execute our server action and pass this quantity to it. Remember, we need a transition to execute a server action in a client component to get the appropriate loading and error handling. So we scroll to the top of the card entry file again. Here inside the function at the top, again, we create this const is pending, comma start transition. The same one we used in our add to cart button and we assign this to a use transition. Back down into the onChange handler. We have this new quantity. Now we start a transition to which we pass this async arrow function again. And in here we can call and await set product quantity, which is the server action, to which we pass the idea of the product comma and the new quantity that we just selected. And again, to have some feedback, I want to show a loading spinner while the server action is running. We put it here below the total price. We don't need a success text this time because we see the up-to-date value in the dropdown. So a loading state is enough. We add an expression here. Check if is pending is true. And if this is true, we want to render a span again that contains the loading spinner. So span with the class names loading, loading spinner, and loading sm for the size. Okay, and when we save this, this should now work. Let me select a different quantity, 3, it loads. And it changed the quantity also up here in the nav bar and also the total price. This all gets refreshed because we call revalidate path here, which revalidates this whole page and fetches the latest data. But I put this loading spinner in the wrong place. I actually want to have it inside this diff here so that it's shown right next to the total price. So now it looks like this. Just one more addition. I also want to have an option for zero, right? 
so that we can remove an item. We put this above the quantity options. I don't make it part of the loop because the text will be a bit different. So we add an another option here and the text will not only contain the number zero but also remove in parentheses. This is also how Amazon does it. And the value will be zero. And remember in our server action, zero means that the item will be completely deleted from the card. So let's try this out. Let's refresh this so we see the correct data again. Now we have zero remove, which removes this item from the card completely. But then it also makes sense to have some text here when our card is empty, right? So it doesn't just look like this and the user might be confused. So let's go into the card page once again and go below the map function here inside the div. We add another expression. We want to check if exclamation mark card.items.length, which means that it's either undefined or zero. If this is the case, we want to render a text. So we can use a paragraph tag for this or a div doesn't really matter because it's unstyled in Tailwind anyway. Your card is empty. There's the text. And then I also want to put the total price of all card items at the bottom and a checkout button. So below this expression, we put another div. In here, we put another paragraph tag to which we add the class name mb3 for a margin and font bold. This will contain the total price, just like we show in the navbar. So this says total colon, curly braces, format price. And to this we pass card dot subtotal. And again, if this is undefined because we don't have a card yet, we fall back to zero. There is the total value, it's zero right now. And below we put a checkout button, which we style with BTN and BTN primary. And this will say checkout. Again, we don't add functionality to this checkout button here. If you want Stripe integration, then let me know in the comments below, then I will make a separate tutorial about Stripe. I also want to center these items. So we add a class name to this div. We make this a flex box and a flex column. And what I want to do is on very small screens, I want the button and the total amount to be on the right side because that's usually easier to click when you are on your phone and you want to use your thumb. And on larger screens, I want to align this in the middle. Also, I just think it looks cool for responsiveness. So again, we can use breakpoints for this. We use items end to align the items on the right side. And then on small screens and larger, we use items center instead. One more thing, I also want to change the size of the checkout button, but only on this SM breakpoint. So here we add SM colon, and then I want to set the width of this button to a hard-coded 200 pixels, which makes it a bit wider. So now the button and the total amount are centered like this but on very small screens, it moves to the right side and the button gets a bit smaller. I think this just looks better and it's great for usability, I think. Okay, let's format this and just try it out one more time with different card items to make sure this works. So some headphones, add to card. Again, this glitch where the font flashes for a moment will not be in production. This only happens in development. So maybe let's add two cameras and maybe one bar stool. Go to the card, we see our subtotal here. We also see it here at the bottom and we see the correct quantities, right? Which we can also change. It updates all these values. And again, if we change the price, for example, of a product in the database and the user comes back to their card, then these changes will be reflected in the UI. The way we fetch our data, they will always see the latest price and the latest product information. So this works really cool and professionally in my opinion. Okay, cool. Then the next step is to add user authentication into our website so that a user can log in and can also connect a shopping cart to their account. 
so very exciting stuff, you don't want to miss this. To handle authentication, we will use NextAuth, which is an authentication library specifically for Next.js. It works with different authentication strategies, so we have a lot of different providers available. In our app here, we will only implement the Google provider to have Google login, but you can easily add additional login providers later if you want. And it also has different database adapters that we can use. There is an adapter for Prisma and MongoDB, which makes it very easy to store user information and also session data in our MongoDB database using Prisma. Here you can see that we have some stuff that we have to add to the Prisma schema, but I will show you exactly how this works in a moment. To implement Google Authentication, we need a project in the Google Cloud Console. So you can either go to a console.cloud.google.com or click on the link in the video description and then we want to set up a project here. This is free to use. If you already have a Google account, then you should also be logged in automatically. And here we can create a new project. I'm going to call it Next.js e-commerce. And then we click on create. This takes a moment to create this new project. And then when this is done, we click on select project, which selects this project up here on the dropdown. Okay, and then in the sidebar, we want to go to credentials, which is part of APIs and services. Here we have credentials, but we have to go to the O of consent screen first because we have to set this up first. Okay, let's go through these steps. User type external, because we want to make this website available to all kinds of users, at least in theory. Create, we have to give this app a name. Mm. Next.js e-commerce. User support email, for this we can select the email address of this Google account. We don't have to upload a logo. I think we can leave this stuff here empty for now as well. Developer contact information, again I'm gonna use the same address here. Coding and flow recording at gmail.com. And then we click on save and continue. Here we can select scopes. We only need the user profile info and the email address. This doesn't require access to any specific Google service. And we also don't need any special permissions to get these values. We click here on update. We don't need any sensitive or restricted scopes. So we click on save and continue. We can set up test users while this app is not in production that are allowed to log in. Again, I'm going to use the recording email address and maybe at the second one here, info at codingandflow.com, add, save and continue. Okay, now we can confirm this external. We have a project name, email address, and so on. Scopes, test users. Yeah. Then we click back to dashboard. So this app is now in testing mode. If you ever want to publish your website, then you also have to publish this Google app to make it available in production. But for testing purposes, this is now working. And then we want to set up credentials. So we click on credentials here in the sidebar and then on create credentials. And we need an OAuth client ID. The application type is a web application name, maybe let's call this Next.js app or whatever. Then for authorized redirect URIs, we add the URI to localhost 3000 with HTTP colon in front of it. That's not HTTPS on localhost, that's just HTTP. And then we need this exact path here because this is what Next of expects. This is where Google will redirect us to after the login was successful. And this is where next off reads the data out of the Google profile and gives it to us basically. So this has to point to slash API slash off slash callback slash Google. We add this here. And of course, later in production, you have to add a second redirect URL with the actual deployment domain. Okay, we click on create. And then we get a client ID and a client secret. And we want to put both of them into our end file in our project, where we already have our database credentials. So here we add the Google client ID, and then we copy paste this value over here from your Google Cloud Console. 
and a Google client secret, which was the second string that we got. We paste it here as well. Then we can close the Google Cloud Console because we shouldn't need this anymore. Now our client is set up and we can use this to log in via Google. There are two more environment variables that we need for next off. The first one is next of underscore URL, which contains the base URL of our website. And you have to give this variable this exact name with the same spelling because next of expects a variable with this name. So we set this to the base URL again, HTTP colon slash slash localhost colon 3000. And then we also need a next of underscore secret. This is just a random string, so you can type any letters in here that you want that is used to encrypt the session cookie later. This is just needed for security, and this is basically a password. You can add any string you want here. This next of secret is only required in production. Later we will deploy this website, and then we will get an error if we don't have this value set. Okay, let's save this. And then the way next of works is that we have to set up a route handler so an API endpoint in Next.js under a very specific URL. And every authentication request will then go to this URL and next off will handle this. This is also where we pointed the redirect URL in the Google Cloud Console to earlier. So we go in the sidebar here. In the app folder, we create a new folder called API. And we have to put this folder in here with this exact name because next off expects a very specific route. In here we put another folder called off, then another folder called scrap records dot dot dot, next off as one word, and in here finally we put the route handler, which we call route.ts. Route handlers are how you set up API endpoints, so server endpoints in the Next.js 13 app when you use the app router. And this part here with the dot 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 is a so-called catch all segment. This allows next off to handle different routes under this endpoint and not just a single one. Okay, and in this route.ts file, we export const of options. And this time the name is arbitrary again. So this doesn't have to be called of options. And this will be of type next of options, which is an import from next of. And this will just contain the next of configuration. The reason I put this configuration into a separate variable and export it from this file is because we also need this object later in other places in our app. Okay. And we set the adapter to a Prisma adapter. This is available in next of by default. And this allows us to save user information and session data in our MongoDB database using Prisma. So this works together really well. And to the Prisma adapter, we pass our Prisma client. Now this complains because there's a TypeScript problem that requires us to also cast this to an adapter, to a next of adapter, so that this error message disappears. Sometimes there are some TypeScript shenanigans that you have to work around. Comma. And then we set providers to an array. Here you can add multiple providers, but again, in this video, we only add Google login. So here we pass a Google provider. Okay, autocomplete doesn't work. The import is import Google provider from next of slash providers slash Google. There it is. Now we can use the Google provider down here and configure it with curly braces. This expects the client ID and the client secret that we already have, right? In our environment variables. So we can get them with process.env dot, we need the same name, Google client ID and client secret is process.env dot Google client secret. Now this complaints, we will get rid of this error in a moment, but first let's finish this file here. So we have our off options and below we create a const handler. Again, this is explained in the next off documentation. Here we call this next off 
function to which we pass the off options. And this sets up next off with this configuration here, with our Prisma adapter and the Google provider. And then we have to export it the following way. Export curly braces, handler as get, comma, handler as post. This weird syntax is necessary because right now next off is still configured to work with the old pages directory in Next.js and not with the app directory that we are using. And this is why we have to write a special syntax to make this work with route handlers. But this is totally valid. This is also described in the documentation. Now this here complains because an environment variable can always be undefined because you might have forgot to set it. But the Google provider expects defined values for client ID and client secret. Now one simple way to get around this would be to just add the non-null assertion operator here with exclamation marks. But this is actually not great because if we actually forget to set these environment variables, then we will continue with undefined values and this will just misbehave. It's better to actually check if all our environment variables are set and throw an error if this is not the case. This is why we also installed the Zot library here. We can use this to validate the values, for example, our environment variables. This is a very useful thing to do in your Next.js projects so that you can always work with defined environment variables. And I will show you how you can set this up. We want to go into our lib folder again and put another file in here, which we just call env.ts. Here we want to import Zot from Zot. Then we create a validation schema for our environment variables. Const, I'm going to call it env schema. And then we can create such a Zot object. In the Zot object, we can pass validation rules. And in here, we want to add the same variables that we also have in our normal.env file. So we want to copy all these five names and paste them in here. And now we can add validation rules to all of them. And they all have the same rules. They are all strings that are not empty. So behind each of them, we write a colon. And by the way, you can duplicate the cursor by pressing somewhere. Then you hold Control Alt. I guess on Mac, this is Command Alt. I'm not sure. And then you press the down arrow. And then we press the end button on the keyboard to get to the end of the line. But you can also handle each line manually if you want. Okay, so each of them will be a zot.string, which is a function. And then we also call non-empty to guarantee that this string contains something and a comma at the end of each line. Now below, we export a const that we call env and we assign this to env schema.parse. This way we can pass a value to the schema and validate it. And what do we want to pass? Well, we want to pass all our environment variables to it. Because we expect our environment variables to adhere to this exact schema. We should have these five keys that are all non-empty strings. And now if one of them is missing or emptier, then Zot will throw an error with a readable error message instead of just giving us an undefined value. And now we go back into our route file. And instead of process.env, we just use env and we import this from our lib folder, the file we just set up. And now since we validated this with Zot, this is guaranteed to be a string. If it's missing, we will get an error. Okay, next we go into our root layout and we have to wrap our whole layout into a session provider. What this does is it makes the session, so our locked in user basically, available to all components throughout our app. This is actually only necessary to get a session in client components because in server components it works differently and we would not need this in our app because we fetch all our session data server side, but it's still good to add this because if you need a session client side, then you need this wrapper. Okay, autocomplete doesn't work. So we have to import this manually. Import the structure from next of slash react. And in here we can find this session provider. And we want to wrap our navbar, our main tag and the footer 
into the session provider, again to make the session available to all our pages. But when we save and refresh this, I think we should get an error. Yeah, there it is. Because this uses React context internally and this requires a client component, but the root layout is a server component. Now we could make the whole root layout a client component to fix this, but there's actually a better way to fix this. Basically what we want, we want the session provider to have to use client directive at the top, just like our own client components. The problem is many of these libraries haven't added this yet because React server components are still newer and we can't go into the source code of the session provider and add use client there ourselves, right? But there is an easy workaround for this. We just have to export these third party components that we want to turn into client components from our own client file. So we go into our app folder and put a new file here, which we give the same name, session provider. .tsx. We make this file a client component and then we simply re-export the session provider from next off. So we add the same package here, but this time we write export instead of import. So again next off slash react. And here we have the session provider, but we want to make this the default export which we can do with this syntax. Then we go back into our root layout and we want to change the import statement here. We don't want to import this from next off anymore, but our own file. So dot to get into the parent folder slash session provider. And since this is now the default export, we can delete these curly braces. And now this should work because we turned the session provider into a client component. We can still use all the features of it, no problem. But now we can also use it inside a server component. Next, we have to add some newer models to our Prisma schema. This is described in the next of documentation. They have instructions for the different adapters and we are using the Prisma adapter. We have to add these models here, the account and user session and so on. And then we also have to make some modifications to make this work with MongoDB but I already prepared all of this. Let's go back into our project and into the schema.prisma file. And at the bottom below the card item model, we have to copy paste a bunch of new models. I will put a link to this schema file into the video description below so you can copy paste this from there. So this includes the user account, this contains the username, email address, and the image, which we get from Google when the user signs in. Then the Google account information is stored as well in a separate collection. There is some stuff in here that we don't actually need, but we might need this in the future if we change our authentication strategy. So it's good to add all of this. Then we also store a session in the database when the user is logged in. Sessions are alternative to JWT authentication. When you connect next off to a database using one of these adapters, the Prisma adapter in our case, then authentication will automatically be handled with sessions. Session means that when a user logs in, there is a session entry created in our database that contains the user ID and an expiration date. Sessions are easier to use correctly than JWTs because you can invalidate sessions simply by deleting them from the database. So if a user changes their password, for example, and you want to lock them out everywhere else, then you can just delete their sessions. Whereas this is not possible with JWTs by default because they are self-contained. In order to implement JWTs properly, you have to implement a complex refresh token mechanism. This is also possible, it's also possible with next off, but sessions are much easier to use correctly. But again, next off handles these sessions automatically for us. We don't have to create them, next off does this. And then we also have this verification token model. As far as I know, these are only used if you implement login with an email link, which we are not using here. But again, it's still good to add all of these models at once in case you want to add additional authentication strategies. Okay, and then we also want to be able to connect a shopping cart to a user, right? So that we don't only have anonymous shopping carts where we store the card ID in a cookie. Instead, we can also store a user ID on a card and this way know which user this belongs to. So on the card model, and I put this above the timestamps, we add a user ID, 
which will be of type string. This will contain an object idea, but we make this value optional with a question mark after string because anonymous shopping carts don't have a user ID, right? And then we also need this object ID annotation because this contains a MongoDB object ID. Then we also add the relation below, like we also did for the product and the cart on the cart item. We call this one just user. It will be of type user, which is our user model that we just copy pasted. It's optional again, because it's connected to the user ID, which is also optional because a card could not belong to a user account. Yeah, and then we add the same line as here, basically. Just that we change this to user ID. We press the formatting shortcut to align this properly. And the counterpart to this user field here is on the user model, this card array. I think if we delete this and press the formatting shortcut again, yeah, it gets added back automatically because this belongs to this user relation we set up here. This relation basically allows us to do two things. First of all, when we delete a user, we can automatically delete their cards. And for an existing user, we can fetch all their cards if we allow multiple cards per user. But again, this whole file is linked in the video description below, so you can copy paste it from there. It's still good to understand what is going on here. Okay, and then we want to push these changes to our database to create these new collections. So we open the terminal, stop the execution, and run npx prisma db push again. As you can see, it created and configured a bunch of new collections, which we should now find in our Atlas backend. Sessions, verification tokens, users, and so on. They are all empty right now. And then we want to regenerate our Prisma client to have these new methods available. I think this actually happens automatically when you run db push. But just to be sure, we run npx Prisma generate again which generates this new updated Prisma client. And then we are npm run dev again. Okay, and then I want to put a newer button into our navbar that shows the profile picture of the user when they are logged in and also contains a drop-down menu to log out. This button needs to be a client component because we need to handle button clicks there. And the same as we did for the shopping cart button, let's put it into its own file so that we can keep the navbar itself as a server component. So we have the shopping cart button, we create a new file, which we call user menu button. So then we export a default function, user menu button. And here we return a div. We also add props, interface, user menu button, props. We want to show the currently locked in user in this user button. And we can get the user out of the session. And we get the session from next off. So we add session colon as a prop. And we set the type to session from next off, this one here. So this is the import statement. But the user might not be locked in. So we add a vertical bar and null, so that we can also pass null for the session. Now we could also fetch the session directly in here with this use session hook from next off. This fetches the session client side, but I want to fetch the session server side in our navbar, which is a server component, because this way the session data is available as soon as our page is opened. There is no short moment when the user is not authenticated, instead the user is locked in right away. And this is also how we set up our shopping cart, right? I want there to be no loading time. Instead, I want all the data to be there as soon as the page is opened. Again, because I think this feels more professional. And this is also how it works on websites like Amazon. This is why we don't get the session directly in here, because this has to be a client component. We also add the use client directive at the top, because we later need to handle on-click events here. And this is only possible in a client component. Then we destructure our props as usual here in the function user menu props and in here is our session. And then 
the first line of this function, we want to get the user object out of the session, which we can do with session.user. And it adds the save call operator because the session can be null. Okay, and then we finish the layout itself. We add some class names to the outer div. Again, we use dropdown and dropdown end, which we also used before for the shopping cart button. Again, we put a label with this tab index zero in here. And we add some class names to the label as well. BTN, BTN ghost and BTN circle. Again, the same classes we used on the shopping cart button. Okay, and then in this button, I want to show something different depending if the user is logged in or not. So we add an expression that checks if the user is defined. We use the ternary operator with a question mark. If the user is defined, I want to render the user image in the next image. Before we set up this image, let's also at the second part of the ternary operator. Colon, if the user is not defined, I want to render yeah, three little dots here, which indicate that this is a drop-down menu. For this, we use an SVG again. And again, I will link this file in the video description so you can copy paste it from there. We can't get around this because yeah, we can't type this out by hand. We can only copy paste these SVGs. Let's press the formatting shortcut so this gets aligned properly. And again, Prettier automatically adds these parentheses which are very useful. For the source of the image, we want to pass user.image. And again, we get this from Google when we log in. This will automatically be filled with the image of the Google account of the user. But user can be undefined, right? So we have to add a save call operator here. And we want to use something else as a fallback. For this, I prepared this profile big placeholder image, which is in the assets folder. This one here. I want to import this and use this as a fallback. So at the top, we import profile pick placeholder from at slash assets slash profile pick placeholder PNG. And then we can use it as the fallback here. Profile pick placeholder in case the user or the image is undefined. We set the alt text to just profile picture. I think this is enough. We set the width and height both to 40 pixels. And then we also want to style this with W10, which sets the width of the image, but in CSS to the same 40 pixels as we also loaded. Because again, the final dimensions are dictated by CSS, not by these values we are using here at least when we use this component. And then we want to make this a circle, which we can do with rounded full. This sets the border radius to over 9000. And this creates a round image. Okay, so if the user is logged in, we see their profile picture. If they are not logged in, we see this SVG, which is three little dots, basically. You will see this in a moment. And outside of this label, but still inside this div, Inside the drop-down menu, we add the drop-down menu items. So in here we put a UL, an unordered list. This is just a normal HTML tag. And to the opening tag of UL, we add this tab index zero again. Again, this is necessary for accessibility so that we can use tab to navigate between our menus. And again, this needs a class name, which are drop-down content menu rounded box and again I got all of them from daisy UI menu minus sm then we need this c index again to make sure that this menu is in the foreground we add the margin top with mt3 we set the width to w52 let me make this bigger we set the background color with bg base 100 then we need some padding. And lastly, we also want to give this a shadow, not SM, but just normal shadow. And into the UL, we put list items for the single buttons in our dropdown menu. So LI, you can put multiple ones in there. We actually only need one, but the contents of this item are different depending if we are locked in or locked out. 
if we are logged in, we want to show the logout button. And if we are logged out, we want to show the login button, right? So we add an expression here again with a ternary operator. If we have a user, then we want to render a button that says sign out. If the user is not logged in, then we want to render a button that says sign in. And then we give both of these buttons on-click handlers. This is why we had to make this a client component because we can only use on-click with JavaScript. And in here we pass an error function like this. And in order to sign out, we can call this sign out function, which is coming from next off. So we add this import here and we call this function. We can also configure this between curly braces and we can say, when we are logged out, we want to be redirected back to the front page. So we can set the callback URL to the home page. And to sign in, we also pass an on-click handler with an anonymous function, which simply calls sign in. Now, instead of these functions, we could also use links because there are specific URLs where we can navigate the user to, so they also get to the next of login screen. The benefit of using the sign in function rather than the sign in URL endpoint is that this automatically redirects us to the previous page after signing in. So if we are on a product page and we sign in, we get redirected to the product page and not to the home page. And the same is the case for sign out by default, but here we are have changed this behavior by setting the callback URL explicitly. You can remove this if you want. Okay, let's format and save this. And now we only have to add this user menu button to our navbar and then login should work. I just realized one little mistake. I want this not to be a BG Blue, but BG Base 100. This is the correct value. Okay, then we open the navbar TSX file and we want to put the user menu button right next to the shopping cart button and it's already styled correctly but this expects the session as input right which we want to fetch here in our navbar because again the navbar is a server component and this way we can fetch the session before the page is actually opened so here at the top we create a const session we call await get server session this is a function from next off that we can use in server components to get a session of the logged in user from the database. Now to this get server session, we also have to pass the off options. Where is this coming from? Those are the next off options that we set up in our route handler earlier. This is why we export them here because we have to pass them to get server session. Otherwise this will not work. Okay, so this way we get the session of the currently logged in user from the database. And the way this works is that next off sets an encrypted cookie in the browser of the user to identify the correct session in the database and know if they are logged in or not. And then we simply pass the session to our user menu button and save this. And now on our website, when we refresh the page, we should see our user menu button. And there it is, we are currently not logged in. So we see these three little dots, which are the SVG we pasted. And now let's try this out. Let's log in by clicking sign in. By default, we get to this screen here. You can customize this screen or replace it for a completely different one. This is explained in the next of documentation, but for our project here, this is fine. Sign in with Google. And then I want to sign in with one of my accounts. Then we get redirected back to the page. And this error happens because we are trying to load the profile picture from googleusercontent.com, but this will only work if we allow this address in our next config file. So we go into our project, open nextconfig.js, and here we already allow images from unsplash.com, right? So here we want to add a second entry. So a comma, another pair of curly braces, and we set the host name to this one here. Let's actually copy this, put it here. Maybe the address is different for you. Copy whatever you see here as the host name. We save this and we restart the development server with npm run dev, but we should still be logged in, I think. So let's refresh the page. And 
And there we are. And this is the profile picture of my Google account, which you can also see up here. And this user information is now stored in the database. Let's refresh this. Here we have the user, Florian Walter, with the image from Google. And in the accounts collection, there is all the information about this Google account. Now, right now, a user account doesn't have their own shopping cart yet. We still have our anonymous shopping cart that's connected to the cookie. We will set up user shopping carts in the next section, and then we will also merge the anonymous card with the user's card when we log in. Let's check if logout works as well. So I click on sign out and we are logged out. Let's log in again, sign in with Google, calling in a flow recording account, and we are logged in. Really cool. And again, since we fetched the user server site in our navbar, when we refresh the page, the user is there immediately. There is no glitch in the UI, there is no loading state. We have the user and the shopping cart both available as soon as the page is opened. But to see that we are actually authenticated, let's add some protection to our add product page. We make it so that not anyone can open this page. Instead, we have to be logged in to add a product. Of course, in a real app, you probably want to make this available only for an administrator. But here we will just add simple authentication protection. So the add product page is a server component, right? This means we can fetch our session with get server session again, to which again we have to pass the off options. We also have to make this an async function. And then we can simply check if session is undefined or null. Then we want to redirect the user. And we already have this import here from next navigation to the sign in endpoint, which we find under slash API slash off slash sign in. And as I explained earlier, by default, when we use the URL instead of the sign in function, this doesn't redirect us to the page where we were previously at. It redirects us to the front page instead. But we can configure this manually by adding the callback URL param, so question mark, callback URL in camel case spelling like this. And then we want to redirect to slash add minus product so that we get back to this add product page. So let's try this out. While we are logged in, we should be able to access the add product page. But if we logged out, we should be redirected to the login page when we try to access the add product page. We get to the login page, we log in, and then we should be redirected to the add product page. So this works. It also makes sense to add a protection to the server action itself in case we are trying to call this while we are not logged in. So here at the top, after use server, we fetch the session here as well with a wait get server sessions to which again we pass the off options. Now we basically want to do the exact same thing as here. If the session is null, we want to redirect the user. But this happens when we click the add product button while we are not logged in. Okay, before we go on, let's also check if our env validation here works. So when I remove an environment variable from the .env file, for example, the Google client idea, and then restart the development server, we should see an error message because this will not be able to fetch the user information. Let's try this out. We refresh the page. The session is null and we get the sort error, which is caused because it's trying to pass the env schema with the process.env files. But since the Google client ID is missing, this throws an error with a very readable error message. We immediately see what is wrong and we don't accidentally continue with an undefined value. So this works as well. Let's add the Google client ID back. Restart the development server and open our page again. 
Okay, now let's go into our card TS file in the lib folder again and adapt our get card and create card functions to our new user authentication. Let's start with create cards. So right now we only create an anonymous card that's not connected to a specific user, right? So in here, let's fetch the session. Const session equals await get server session. We can use get server session here because we only call create card from server components. Again, we have to pass the off options here. And then instead of creating the new card variable here, we delete a const and instead above we create a let new card, which is of type card. That's the type coming from the Prisma client. This is the same type we get back when we call card.create. It's an unpopulated card. Okay, then below we want to check if we are logged in. So we check if session has a value. If it doesn't have a value, then we want to create our anonymous card as before. So we paste in this part and we also paste in the code that creates the cookie. If we are logged in, we also want to create a new card, but this one will be tied to a user account. So again, await prisma.card.create. Then we pass data. And here we want to set the user ID to session.user. Dot ID. Now the ID is by default not contained in the user object because next of doesn't return it to us by default. We have to add this ourselves. So let's just write ID here for now. This gives us an error. We go into our route handler. So this next of route file we created earlier. And here we can change what data we want to return in the user object by adding a callback. So under providers, we add this callbacks field to which we pass curly braces. And in here we get auto completion. We can use this session callback, which will be triggered whenever we return a session from the database. And here we can hook into this process and modify what data we get back. We can also destructure these params here. So we remove params and add curly braces instead. And in here we want to have the session and the user object. And then we can say we want to set session.user.id to the idea that's contained in this user object. This way we take the ID of the user in our database and add it to the session so that we can access it here. But TypeScript doesn't recognize that there is an ID field on this session user. In JavaScript, this will just work. But in TypeScript, we also have to configure this type here. Before we do this, let's finish this function. At the end, we have to return this session so that we can use it in our app. To fix this problem here, we have to extend this user type. For this, we go into our folder and outside of SRZ this time. So right here with all these configuration files, we want to create a new folder, which we call add types. This is a naming convention for type files. In here, we put a new file that we call nextof.d.ts. D.ts files are TypeScript declaration files. And here we can make changes to existing types. And in here we write declare module and as a string, we write next of, because this is the library where we want to make changes to a type, curly braces, and we want to change the session interface. So we want to change this session object, which contains the user, but the user doesn't have an idea. So in interface session, we write user colon, again, a pair of curly braces, and in here we put the ID value that we want to add to this user. It's of type string. But we also want to have all the other values that are on the user available by default, because when we write it this way, now the user only has an idea. 
to also add these other values back to the user, we go after the closing curly brace here, write an ampersand sign to create an intersection type, and then we use default session from next off, to which we add square brackets, and then here we write user as a string. So this way we extend this next off user and add this idea field to it. Let's reformat this and save it. And now our errors here disappeared. And now in our card file in the lib folder, we also don't have an error anymore. Now the idea of the user is added to the user in the session when we return a session. Okay, so now when we call create card, it checks if the user is logged in. If yes, it creates a card connected to this user. If not, it creates an anonymous card like before. Now let's scroll up to create card and do the same here as well. In the first line, we want to retrieve the session. Then we want to create a variable for this card here. So we remove the const here. Instead, we create a let card. But this card we fetch here is populated with the product information, right? With these include options we used here. So the return type of this is card with products, the type that we created earlier. So let card card with products or null if we don't have a card yet, and we initialize this with null. Then again we check if we have a session or not. If we don't have a session, we want to do the same as before. We want to fetch the cookie with the local card idea and fetch this anonymous card. If we have a session, we want to fetch the card of this user. So card equals await prisma.card.find first. This time it's not find unique because a user can have multiple cards, but here we only support one card. So we use find first. And in curly braces, we add the filters. We want to fetch the card where the user idea in the card, that's part of the schema that we modified earlier. So a card now has a user idea, which is optional. We want to find the card where the user idea is the idea of the currently locked in user. Comma, and of course we want to include the same populated card item data. And the rest stays the same, right? So let's try this out. When I refresh the page, we should see an empty card because there is no card connected to this user account yet, right? So I have to start the development server again. Refresh the page. And the card is empty. Now we should be able to add an item to the card. It creates a card for this particular user. When we log out, we should see the anonymous card again. So that's the anonymous card. And when we log in, we should see this user's card again. And we should also see two cards in our database. There they are. One has a user idea, the other doesn't. Okay, cool, so this is working. Now let's implement the logic that merges the anonymous card with the user's card when we log in. This is also how it works on Amazon. So you are logged out, you add some items to your card, and then you log into your account. These items are moved into your user card. For this, let's create a new function here in our lib folder, in our card.ts file. Let's put it at the bottom. Export async function. And I'm going to call it merge anonymous card into user card. It's a very long name, but it's very descriptive. And to this function, we pass the idea of the user that we want to merge the card into. And here we have to write a little bit of logic. The first step is we want to fetch the local card if one exists. So first we need a cookie, just like in get card. Let's copy this line, put it here. Okay, and we also want to get the local card from the database, right? So let's copy this part here as well. 
Where we assign local card. We create a const card where we assign this tour. And we need to populate the items because we want to merge these items together. So we need to know which items are in the card, but we don't need the product information because this is not necessary to merge these cards. So what we do is we remove this part here, include product true and just write true instead. This populates the items field, but it doesn't populate the card items with the product information. Instead, they will only contain the quantity and the product ID. Let's also rename this variable to local card. And if there is no local card, then there's nothing to merge, right? So below we check if exclamation mark local card, we just run a return. If there is a local card, then next we need the user's card. So we create a const user card equals await prisma dot card dot find first again. Again, because a user can have multiple cards, so this doesn't work with find unique, where the user IDs match with the user ID value we pass to this function. And again, we want to include the card items in here, but we don't need the product information. Okay, and then we want to merge the items of the user card with the anonymous card. Then we want to delete all the currently existing items in the user card and replace them for these merged items. And then finally, we also want to delete the anonymous card so that it's empty again. So we have to do several database operations. Now, what we have to keep in mind is what happens if we get an error somewhere in the middle? For example, what happens if we delete the items from the user card, but we get an error before we insert the new items and then the user card is suddenly empty. This is why we want to execute all of this in a transaction. A database transaction is a process where you can do multiple operations, but if one of them fails, the whole transaction will be rolled back and none of the changes will be applied. And I think pretty much all types of databases support transactions, including MongoDB. And to execute a transaction with Prisma, we go below and we write await prisma.transaction and it starts with a dollar sign. This is the function name. To this function, we can pass an async function where we execute the actual transaction. And this async function gets passed an argument, which is again a Prisma client, but every operation we call on this Prisma client in here will be part of the transaction. And in the documentation, they call this TX, which I guess stands for transaction. So we add this argument here. And again, TX is just a Prisma client on which we can do our usual operations. Now, before we set up this transaction, we have to create another function below outside of merge anonymous card into user card. This function will contain the actual logic that merges the items in these two cards. So we call it merge card items. And to this function, we pass the user card and the anonymous card, right? But I wrote the function in a way that we can pass any arbitrary number of cards to it. So if you want to merge three cards for whatever reason in the future, then this will work as well. For this, we use this syntax where we start the argument with three dots. This way we create so-called var args, meaning that we can pass as many of these arguments to this function as we want. And we call these arguments card items. And the type of this var arg argument is an array of card items from the Prisma client. But then we add another array because we can pass as many of these card item arrays as we want, as I just explained. So this is an array of array of card items. And in here, we want to take each entry of these two cards and combine them together. So if one has a quantity of one and one has a quantity of two, then we want a quantity of three. And if the anonymous card contains items that are not in the user card yet, then we want to add them. But instead of writing this out by hand, I just copy paste this here. You can pause the video and type this out. This is nothing new, it's just a bit complicated. It uses the reduce function and the for each loop to go through each of the card items and then combine the quantities. To be honest, I had GitHub Copilot write this logic for me. GitHub Copilot, in case you don't know, is an AI plugin. For VS Code, it's very useful to create boilerplate code like this automatically. 
But all of this still makes sense. So if you go through this step by step, then you will understand what exactly is happening here. Again, just take a moment, type this out, and then we can continue our transaction here. So in the transaction, we want to check if the user card exists. If it exists, we want to merge it with the anonymous card. If it doesn't exist, we want to create a completely new user card, right? So we check if user card, we do this inside the transaction. And let's also add the else block white array so we don't get confused by the nesting later. If there is a user card, we want to use our merge card items function to merge the anonymous card with the user card. So we create a const, let's call it merged with a deal card items. And for this, we call our merge card items function to which we pass local card dot items comma and user card dot items. Again, since we made this a war arc, we can pass as many of these card item arrays as we want. So this now contains the merged card items. The next step is to delete the existing items in the user card and then put these new merged card items in there instead. So we call await tx, which is this Prisma client on which we do the transaction operations, card item dot delete menu. And in the filter, we define which ones we want to delete with this where value. And in here, we want to compare the card idea to the user card dot idea, because we want to delete all card items that belong to this user card and then put our new merged card items in there. So below we write await tx.cardItem.create menu. And for the data, we want to pass the merged card items, not merged card items, because that's the name of the function, merged card items, which is our new array up here. Now, each of these merged card items also contains the idea of this card item in the database it had before. But we are making new database entries here and we want a new auto-generated idea. So we want to ignore this ID field. We only care about these other three fields. We can do this by mapping these merged card items. So again, in the map function, we get past each item. We add parentheses and curly braces because these curly braces are not the block of this function. They are the return value, the JavaScript object that we want to return. This is why we have to wrap this into parentheses. And as I said in here, we want to put the card idea, which is user card dot idea. We want to set the product idea to item dot product idea. And we want to set the quantity to item dot quantity. So now we put these merged card items in here, but we ignore the IDs to create a completely new idea. And we also set the card ID of all of these items to the user card ID, which is important because the anonymous items didn't have a card ID before, right? So we have to set this here. And that's the ID of the card we found in the database, the existing card. And in the else block, it means we don't have an existing user card yet, and we want to create one. So await tx.card.create. In here, we pass the data as usual, curly braces. We want to set the user ID of this card to the user ID we pass to this function. So we pass this as the first argument. Again, this is a shorthand for writing user ID colon user ID, but the value and the key have the same name. So we can use the short syntax like this. Then we want to put the items in here, items colon. And this is a so-called relation query in Prisma. This way we can create a card in the card collection, but at the same time we can create card items in the card items collection in one operation, and they will automatically be connected together by adding the card idea to these items. Then in here we call create menu to create several card items. And I know that this can look complicated at first, but you just have to work through this because this is how you write these database operations. And here we have to pass data again, for which we want to pass the local card dot items. 
this time it's not the merged card items because in this else block a user card doesn't exist yet. Meaning there are no user card items, there are only local card items. But again we want to map this into the correct structure. Again we get past each item and we return a new JavaScript object for each of them. Now since we do this relation query where we do the operation over the card and not the card item, we don't have to set the card ID this time. This is automatically handled by this operation. Instead, this time we only need the product ID and the quantity. And the card ID will be set automatically. Okay, and after merging the cards has completed, we want to delete the local card and also delete the cookie. So we do this below this whole if block here, still inside the transaction. So if user card, else, and below this else block, we write await tx, we are still inside the transaction, dot card dot delete. We want to delete the card where the ID of the card is the local card ID, the local card that we fetched from our cookie. We want to delete this one and then we want to remove the cookie, which we do with cookies dot set the same name local card idea and then we set this to an empty string. This is how you delete a cookie in Next.js. Okay, maybe let's recap this whole function one more time. We fetch the local card from this cookie. If there is no local card, then we return because there is no data that we have to merge into the user card. If there is a local card, then we fetch the user card from the database. If there is no user card in the database yet, then we just have to create a new one with the items contained in the local card. And if there is already a user card and a local card, then we merge these items and add them all to the user card. And at the end, we delete the local card because we don't need it anymore. We have merged it into the user's card. Okay, this function is ready, but now the question is where do we call our merge function here? We want to call this right after we have logged in. So before the page is open, the merging already happened. And as usual, when we see the page, all the data is already displayed correctly and there is no loading state. So let's go into our next of route handler again. We have this callback here that will be called every time we return a session. And below callbacks, we can also add this events field. And in here we can get called every time we did a certain auth operation. For example, we have this sign in function here. And this is the perfect place to merge our cards because this will be called right after we have signed in, but before we are returned to our homepage. We want to make this an async function because our merge card functions makes database operations. And we want to destructure this argument here. We need this user value to get the user ID. And in here we simply call await merge anonymous card into user card, which expects the user ID that we can get out of this user. This is the user that just signed in. Okay, let's try this out. So the locked in user has one item in the card right now, these shoes for 95 bucks. Let's sign out. In the anonymous card, we have the headphones and this bar stool. And now when we log in, these cards should be merged and we should have three items in there. Let's try this out. Sign into our account. Now the sign in callback is fired, which merges the cards. And there we are. We have our user card with the three items in there. And when we log out again, we should see an empty card because we cleared the anonymous card. This is by the way, also how Amazon handles it. Let's try this one more time. Let's put something into the anonymous card. Maybe two of these plants here. And again, this weird glitch doesn't happen in production. It only happens in development. So now we have two of these plants in here. Again, we log in. And these items will be merged into the user card. And this all works. Isn't this cool? Now let's also try if our transaction works properly. As I explained, if we have an error here somewhere inside this transaction, none of these operations should be applied. Let's try this out by throwing an error here at the very end of the transaction. 
grow error test. Just for a moment, obviously, we will remove this later. So now I do the same process again. I log out, I add this card to the shopping cart. But now when we log in and execute our merge function, it will fail because of this error. But the error is thrown at the very end, after all these operations. But since these operations are part of a transaction, they shouldn't be applied when this error occurs within the transaction. So let's see. We log in again. We should see this error in the console. There it is, error test. Our user card still only has five items because this merging failed. And this one item is still in our anonymous card. So the website still works, but these cards are not merged, but they are also not left in an inconsistent state. So this is a really professional setup. All right, let's not forget to remove this error here. Maybe I will leave this as a comment. One more thing I want to mention is whenever we fetch cookies, like we do when we either get the anonymous card or also inside get server session, then the route that uses this function is automatically dynamically rendered. This is important because when we show the card of the user, this data is different for each individual user, right? So we don't want to cache this page on our backend and serve the exact same page to each user. Every user has their own card. But we don't have to configure this cache ourselves because again, whenever we get cookies, which we do here, but which is also done inside get server session, then the page is rendered dynamically automatically. So it fetches new data whenever we open the page and it's not cached between users. This is where we don't have to add revalidate zero to our card page, for example. This happens automatically because we retrieve the card here. And to verify this, we can actually build the project with npm run build, which takes a moment. This builds this project for production mode. And here we can see from these icons how these pages are rendered and cached. So this lambda symbol here means that the page is not cached. Instead, it's created every time the page is opened. And when we look at the card route here, we see this lambda symbol. So this page is not statically cached, which is good. Okay, this was a tough part, but I think we learned a lot. And in the next section, we will implement pagination here for our front page so that we don't show all products at once. Okay, so to have enough items that we can actually paginate, let's go to the add product page again, which now requires authentication. That's good. And then let's add a bunch of newer products, but let's do so in a loop so that we don't have to uh, repeat this process like 50 times. Let's go to the add product page code. And then just for this one operation, I will put a loop in here. So let's say uh, for I, and let's just put, I don't know, 50 items in here. And then I want to repeat this process here and create the exact same item in the database 50 times, just so that we can later see our full pagination bar with many pages in action. So let's save this. Then we need an image again. As usual, we take this from Unsplash. I'm going to use this clone trooper here because what would be more fitting for 50 items with the exact same data than a clone trooper. So I paste the image URL here, call this clone trooper, description, this is a cool clone trooper. We have many of them. Of course, this data here doesn't matter. And the price will be, uh, I don't know, 19.99. Now we should execute this in this loop and add the same item 50 times, right? So this will take a moment to complete. Okay, let's refresh the page. And now we have this clone trooper in here 50 times. Let's also remove the for loop again, because obviously we don't want to keep this. And then we want to paginate this front page here, because if we have a lot of items in our database, we don't want to show all of them at once. We want to show them in pages. 
So, let's go into our project and set up a pagination bar. We will put this into the components folder because you will likely reuse this in different places. Pagination bar .tsx. As usual, the styling of this component is coming from Daisy UI. This is how it looks. And in this file, we export a default function, which we also call pagination bar. And this component also needs props. Pagination bar props. We need the current page so that we can highlight this element in the pagination bar and also make it not clickable, which will be a number. And we of course need a total number of pages so that we know how many items to show in this pagination bar. Then we add these props down here and destructure them. Current page, total pages. Now in this pagination bar, I don't want to show all pages at once, because if we have 100 pages, for example, then we don't want to show all the numbers from 1 to 100 here, right? We only want to show a subset of these numbers. For this, we will write some logic that calculates these page numbers. You can just follow along. We create a const max page, that's the largest page number that will be shown in our pagination bar. We assign this to math.min, which returns the smallest of the values we pass to this function. To this we pass total pages, comma, and then math.max, which is the opposite of math.min. And here we pass current page plus 4, comma 10. So the max page will be the current page plus 4. So if we are on page 13, for example, the largest page number will be 17. However, if we are on page 1, for example, then there will be no pages to the left of page 1, right? Because there are no smaller pages. In this case, I want to show all the page numbers all the way up to 10. Otherwise, the pagination bar would be very small. Also, if there is no current page plus 4, because we are on page 17, for example, and there are only 18 total pages, then we want to use the total pages instead. This is why we wrap this into math.min. I know this is a bit complicated at first, but you can just play around with this and see how this behaves. Then we also create a const min page for which we use math.max1, math.min, and to math.min we pass current page minus 5 or max page minus 9, like this. Again, this calculates an appropriate value for the min page that is not smaller than 1. And I just came up with this by playing around and see what looks good. And then we want to generate page items from the min page all the way up to the max page. We do this in a loop. So we create another for loop. Let's call the index page. We start at min page. So we replace the zero for min page. And we want to run this until page is less than or equal to the max page. And then inside this loop, we want to add page items to an array. So above the loop, let's create this array. Const numbered page items. This will be of type JSX element array because this contains JSX elements and we initialize this with an empty array. And then in the loop for each round we can say numbered page items dot push to put a new element in here and each page item will be a link. So we use a next link here. The text of the link will be the current page number which is the index of the loop. And then we configure the link itself. So we add an href. And what we do is we navigate to the current page, but we append this page URL query param with a question mark page equals plus the current page number. 
So this adds this page query param to the current destination and we can read the page from the URL in our server component. And then since we are in a loop, we also have to add a key to each element for which we can just use the page number. And then we also want to add a class name to each link. We make this an expression with curly braces and add a backtick string in here. The first class we need for all of these items is this join item class, which is used in Daisy UI for these pagination bar items. And we also use the button class BTN. Then we put an expression in here with a dollar sign and curly braces. And what I want to do is I want to disable the currently selected page item so that we can't even click it. So it has a different styling, but we will also not make it clickable. We can do this with a class, but we want to apply this class conditionally. So in this expression, we check if the current page is equal to the page of this item, then question mark, ternary operator, we want to apply another class in quotation marks. We want to apply btn active, which changes the highlighting color of this item. And then I also want to make this element unclickable, for which we can use the pointer minus events minus none class, which is coming from Tailwind. Then we add the second half of the ternary operator colon, if this item is not the current page, we don't want to add an additional class. So we just pass an empty string here. Okay, and then we create the pagination bar itself in the return statement. So in here we put a div to which we add the class name join. That's the counterpart of join item. This connects these items visually. And in this div we want to render our numbered page items, right? Let's see how this looks. Let's go to our front page. And before we actually fetch the count of pages and items we have, let's just hard code this pagination bar in here for now, just to see how it looks. So we have our pagination bar. Let's set the current page to a three and the total pages to a, a large number, 99 and then see how this looks. There it is. Let's center this on the screen by adding some class names to the outer div. We add flex, flex call, and item center, which should center everything, including the pagination bar. So we see the pages from one to 10. If I set the current page to 13, you can see the responsive page numbers in action. Now the smallest value is eight, the largest one is 17, and we never show all 99 pages at once because that would be too many. But our pagination bar is still not fully responsive. If the screen width is too small, then this will not all fit on the screen. So let's make this responsive by switching to a different kind of view. What I wanna do is when the screen is small, I wanna switch to a, this kind of pagination bar where we just have the current page and a button for left and right. So let's go back into our pagination bar component. And what we can do is we can hide this div on small screens or rather on very small screens by setting this to hidden by default. And then on the SM breakpoint, which are small screens and larger, we want to set the display back to block so we show it on this screen size and larger. And on these very small screens where we hide these page numbers, we want to show a different element instead. And to put multiple elements into this return block, we can wrap this into such a fragment because there always has to be one parent element. And there's no reason to make this a div because only one of these will be shown. A div would work as well as the wrapper, but I think a fragment is more semantically correct. So below the first div, we put a second div. And here we add the class name join again. On very small screens, we set this to display block by default. And on small screens and larger, this one will be hidden. So only one of these two will be shown, depending on the screen size. And in here we put these elements from Daisy UI I just showed you earlier. So we have this left button 
which we only want to show if current page is larger than one, because otherwise there is no previous page that we can navigate to, right? So if the current page is larger than one, we want to render a link. The href again will point to a question mark page equals, and we append current page minus one, and we wrap this into parentheses. And this link needs the same join item and btn classes as we used for our numbered page items. So we add the class name here as well, btn and join item. We close this link tag and as the text we use this left arrow here, which I just copied from Daisy UI. I have no idea how to enter this in a normal keyboard, but I will link this pagination bar again in the video description below, so you can copy it from there. But you can also just use any other icon here. Okay, then we want a button for the current page, right? And then this right arrow. So, below this expression here, where we checked current page larger than one, we add a button. This doesn't have to be a link because this will be disabled anyway. It will not be clickable. So to this button, we add the class names. Again, join item, btn, and pointer events none to make this unclickable. And this will say page and the current page number. Then below the white arrow, we check. If current page is less than total pages, because if we are on the last page, then we don't need the right button. In here again, we put a link just like this one. So let's actually copy this. Just that we want to go to a current page plus one. And the text in here will be a right arrow. Okay, let's save this and see how this looks. So this is the full pagination bar. And if I make this small enough, eventually it turns into this pagination bar. But we can't try it out yet because we haven't set up pagination here yet. So let's do that next. Let's go to the front page, which is the page TSX in the app folder. First of all, we need to uh, read the current page out of the URL because the pagination bar adds this as a URL param, right? So in our page here, we can get the search params from the props. For this, we create an interface called home props. And in here, we add this search params field. And you have to spell it exactly like this in camel case, because this is how we get the search params out of the URL in Next.js. We need this exact prop name. And this will contain an object with the different search params. And in here we expect our page, which will be a string. This number page is coming from the pagination bar, because this is how we called this search param value here. This has to match. And then we can destructure this page here in the component home props. Now this is actually not the page yet. It contains the search params and the search params contain the page. So this is how we destructure this. What we can also do is we can give this a default value of one like this as a string because search params are strings. This way we have a page number to work with even if no query param is added to the URL. And in this case, of course, we want to load the first page. So next we have to turn this page param into a number. So we create a const current page, and then we call pass int to which we pass the page param. And even if we don't pass one, it will be set to a one as the fallback value. Then we also need to define a page size and let's store this value in a variable as well. That's good practice because this way we avoid magic numbers where we just have numbers in our code that we might not remember what the meaning was. So let's create a const page size and let's set this to six. You can also make this larger if you want to deploy this app, but for testing purposes, a small page size is easier to work with. And then we also want to create a number for the hero item count. 
The hero item is this element here at the top. We have to take this into account when we paginate our results because we will only show this on the first page. And again, to avoid magic numbers in our code, I store this value in a variable as well. And maybe in the future, you want to have more than one of these hero items. Then you have to change this number. Then we need the total number of items in our database so that we can calculate the largest page. So we create a const total item count and we can get this through Prisma by calling await prisma.product because this is what we want to count. And then we have this count function here, which returns the total number of products in our database. And from this, we can calculate the number of total pages we have, right? So we created const total pages equals, this would be a total item count divided by a page size. But since we have this additional hero item on the first page, we subtract this from the total item count. So minus hero item count. Of course, we have to wrap this part into parentheses because division takes precedence over subtraction. And this can return a decimal value. So it can return something like 4.5 pages. But we always want to round this up because if we have four and a half page, then we need five pages in our pagination bar, right? So we wrap this into another pair of parentheses. And before it, we add math.seal, which rounds this number we pass in here up. So 4.5, for example, will be rounded up to a five. Okay, now we have the number of pages and now we want to modify our Prisma query to only return the current page. So we keep the order by, we still want to order this with the newest product at the top. And after this, we add the skip field where we can define how many items we want to skip. Because if we are on page two, we want to skip all the items of the first page. So we want to skip current page minus one. So if we are on page two, we want to skip one full page. That's the first page times the page size, right? Now, again, since we have this hero item on the first page, we want to add something to this page size. In parentheses, we want to check if the current page is equal to one. If we are on the first page, then we don't want to skip any additional items because we show the hero item. So after a question mark, we write zero. But if we are not on the first page, we want to skip one, which is the hero item. Actually, we don't want to skip one. We want to skip hero item count. First of all, this makes it more readable because again, we avoid this magic number, but this can also now adapt to a two or more hero items. So now we have defined how many items we want to skip. After this, we add another comma and also add this take field, which tells Prisma how many items to return for this page. This is obviously the page size, but again, we have to account for this hero item. So we add plus. If the current page is the first page, question mark, then we want to add hero item count to the page size. Otherwise, we don't want to add this. Okay, now we have all our values here, so we can use them down here in our pagination bar. But I want to render this pagination bar only if we have more than one page, otherwise it's a bit unnecessary. So we check if total pages is greater than one, only then we want to render this pagination bar. Then for current page, we pass the current page that we passed from the URL. And for total pages, we pass the total pages that we calculated. So now when we save this, we only see six items and we are on page one, right? What happens if we click page two? We still render our hero item at the top. So down here, we only have five items now. So we want to hide this hero item if we are not on page one. So let's scroll up to our hero item right here and render this only if current page is equal to one to Amazon science and we wrap this all around this hero item. But now we still only have five items here because we 
slice the products and we remove the first item. That's the one we were showing in the hero item. So what we do is we remove this whole part and instead we add parentheses and here we check if current page is equal to one, then we want to map from products.slice.one as we did before. But if we are not on the first page, colon, we want to take the whole products array. We don't want to remove the first item if we are on page two upwards. So now when we save this, we see six items. Let's refresh the page just to make sure that the changes are applied correctly. On page three, we still see the same six items and eventually we should get to our old items here, these ones. All of them show six items except for the first page, which shows this additional hero item at the top. So this works correctly. And the currently selected page is contained in the URL. This is basically how you can maintain state in server components. Server components don't have real state. They can't use use state, but they can put information in the URL, like the page number. And when you use search params in a server component, like we are doing here, then this page is automatically dynamically rendered. Meaning every time we open this page or refresh it, we get the latest data and it's not cached. This is because Next.js recognizes that we are reading the search params, which are dynamic. Next.js can't know in advance which search params we are passing here. For example, it can't know which page we are trying to open. So if we added new products to our database, they will always be shown here, even if we don't compile the project again in production. This has the same effect as adding export const. We validate equals zero, which I explain in my Next.js beginner course. This also makes this page dynamically rendered, but again, search params does this automatically. And this is also the behavior we want here usually, because when you add new products to your database, you usually want to show these changes immediately, right? Okay, so our page is already very professional. Next, I want to implement this search functionality here. So the search field itself already works, right? We have already implemented this. So if I search for Trooper, for example, we get redirected to the search page and we add this query as a query param. We just haven't set up the page itself yet. So let's do that next. So we create a new page in the app directory. First, we have to create a folder. Search, that's the relative URL that we navigate to. And then here we put a page TSX as usual. And then we export the default function, which we call search page. And just like on the front page, we want to get the search params out of the URL because this contains the search query. So we create an interface, search page props. And here again, we need the search params with this exact spelling. And this time in here, we expect the query, which is a string. And then here we want to get the search params out of the props. And out of these search params, we want to get the query. And then we want to fetch these results out of the database. So we turn this into an async function. This is just a normal server component. And in here we create the const products and call await prisma dot product dot find menu. We want to return multiple products and then we add our filter here, where colon curly braces. And I want to search in both the name and the description of the product. So we can use this or operator in all uppercase to which we can pass an array with multiple queries. And only one of these queries has to match. So we add them between curly braces. First, we want to search in the name of the product. So we write name colon curly braces, and then we have this contains comparator here. We want to find this if the name contains the query and the query is the search query that we get out of the URL. And then after contains query, we add the comma 
and we set the mode to insensitive, which is a string. This makes the search case insensitive. So it doesn't matter if our query contains uppercase or lowercase letters, this will always find the same results. Then we add a comma at the end and we duplicate this line to add another entry to our OR array here, just that this time we want to search in the description. And again, since this is wrapped into OR, only one of these has to match. And I also want to order these results. So after the WHERE down here, we add ORDER BY, colon, curly braces. Again, we want to order by IDEA in descending order. Again, the ID contains a timestamp. So we have our data and now we want to render this in the UI. First of all, I want to check if products.length is equal to zero. Then we want to return a div that says no products found. And I want to sender this text on the screen. So I add a class name text sender, which again is coming from Tailwind. So this is an early return in case there are no products that match this query. If there are products, we want to return them in a list. So below we add another return statement. We wrap this into a div. Inside this div, we want to map our products, products.map. As usual, we get past each product and we want to render the same product card that we also use on the front page. So to this product card, we have to pass the product and a key with the product ID. We also want to style this grid properly so we can copy these class names here from the front page product card grid. Except for the MI41, we can copy these. You can also type them out by hand if you prefer. And we add them to this div here. So let's save this and see how this looks. We are still on the search page, right? Let's refresh this just to be sure. And here are our results. You can paginate them as well if you want. I didn't bother implementing pagination here, but you already know how this works. Let's search for something else like stool and it finds our bar stool. Of course, you can customize the search to your preferences. Okay, I also want to add a title to this page and I want this title to depend on the search query. So to make this dynamic, we export the function generate meta data. Again, the spelling has to be exact. As we already know, this can take the same props as the page itself. So we pass the search page props and get the query out of here. This function will return metadata. This time we don't have to wrap this into a promise because this will not be fetched asynchronously. We don't need to do a database operation here. We just want to use the query itself in the title. So I want to set the title to a backtick string, search column. Then I put the query in here and then our usual dash flowmason at the end. Yeah, of course, there should be no colon after return. So now this says search colon, then the query we typed in and then flowmason. Really cool. So feature-wise, our app is finished, but we still have to deploy it and there are some additional steps we have to take. But there is one other thing I want to change first, and this will require us to implement a Prisma extension. Prisma extension is a brand new feature that just became available. And this is a very interesting topic that you don't want to skip here. So make sure to watch this tutorial all the way to the end. The fact that we can create anonymous shopping carts is really cool, but one problem this creates is that we might accumulate a lot of abandoned shopping carts in our database. Because a user can create an anonymous shopping cart, but then delete the cookie for example. Or maybe they were using the incognito tab, which doesn't store cookies across sessions. And once this cookie is deleted, there is no connection to the shopping cart in the database anymore, and also no way for the user to retrieve it anymore. 
Instead, the next time they add an item to their cart, they create a completely newer shopping cart. So it might be a good idea to delete these abandoned shopping carts from the database from time to time. For this we can check the updated add timestamp of the cart together with the user ID. We can for example say, okay, if a cart doesn't belong to a user, so if it doesn't have a user ID and it hasn't been updated in a while, then we want to delete it. And then you can also go through the cart items and delete all cart items that belong to the cart that you just deleted. The problem is, right now when we update our cart items in our server actions, the updated add timestamp of the cart is not updated. Because we are doing these updates directly over the cart item model. Now we can change this and use a relation query as we already did before. We use a relation query in our merge cart function. Down here where we create a cart and the cart items in one operation. This is a so-called relation query because we create cart items over this cart model here. So we create two models at the same time. In our server actions we can do the same. Instead of doing the operation on the cart item, we change this query. So let's start with cart item delete in the server action file of the shopping cart page. So instead of cart item delete, we can write await prisma and do it over the cart model. But we don't want to delete a cart, we want to delete the cart items. So on the cart itself, we are doing an update. Parentheses curly braces. We have fetched the cart that we are updating. So we can say we want to update the cart where idea is equal to the cart idea. And then we add this data field that contains the actual update values. And in here we want to update the items, which are the cart items that belong to the cart with this idea. So this will find the items with this cart idea in the cart items collection. And in here we can add the delete operation. And then idea colon article in cart dot idea. Article in cart is what we filtered up here. So this now does the same thing as this operation down here. It's a bit longer, but now this delete operation is routed over our cart model. And this later allows us to update the updated add timestamp of the shopping cart of which we change the cart items to the latest date so that we always know when was the last time we made changes to the items of this card. So now we also delete this operation down here, we don't need it anymore, and we replace the other two as well. So here we are updating card items. To do it over the card we write await prisma dot card dot update again. Again we use this where filter and for the data we pass items colon curly braces again. This time we want to do an update operation. Again we need our filter in here where idea is article in cart dot idea. Again comma and again data with the update values. And we want to update the quantity just like we did down here. So let's delete this operation as well because we have replaced it and one more below. Again await prisma.cart.update again with the same filter data. This time we want to create cart items. So again items colon curly braces create and then the create body, which contains the same values as down here, the product idea and the quantity. And then we delete this operation. Now let's also do the same in the other server actions file, where we have these two operations, let's replace them as well. So await prisma.cart.update Again, we paste our where filter and add the data here. We want to update the items. And on the items, we want to do an update operation with the same filters as down here. So we can copy this part 
and paste it here. And then we delete this old operation. And one more, then we should be done. Await prisma.cards.update. Where the card idea is this one. And then data, items. And in the future, you want to do all your card item updates over the card model to keep this updated as timestamp up to date. And in here we write create. And then we can copy paste this payload here. And delete this operation. Let's save it. Oh, there's one more in the card TS file in the lib folder. We have these two operations here, but since we do them one after another in a transaction, it's enough if we make one of them an update on the card model. So let's keep card item delete menu and replace card item create menu. So await, this time it's this TX Prisma client dot card dot update where the ID is the user card dot idea that's the one we are updating and the local card gets deleted data colon we want to update the card items we want to execute the create many operation and you get auto completion here by the way this helps you with coming up with these operations and then we want to copy this part down here but we can delete the line with the card idea. Since we are doing this operation over the card model, this will be set automatically in this nested update. And then we can delete the create many operation below. So now we are doing all our card item updates over the card model. Unfortunately, this still doesn't update the updated adds timestamp because this by default is only updated if we actually make changes to a card document, so to a value in here. There is an active discussion on GitHub about updating this updated add timestamp of the parent document when we do a nested query like we are doing here. So in the future there might be a setting that you can change to enable this so that the updated add timestamp of the card is updated automatically even when we only update the card items. But right now this doesn't work yet and we have to find our own workaround. Now one way to handle this would be to just add the updated add timestamp to our update operation and set this to a date.now to the current timestamp. But of course this is very tedious because we have to remember to do this in every single update operation and we might forget this somewhere. Now a solution I came up with to fix this is to use a Prisma client extension. This is a brand new feature available for Prisma. Client extensions allow us to hook into our queries for example and then do something in there which will be executed every time we do an operation. For this, let's go into our prisma.ts file where we initialize our Prisma client. And then let's use such an extension to automatically update the updated add timestamp whenever we do an update operation on the card. So what we do is we remove this export from the default Prisma client and we rename it with F2 to Prisma base. And down here we also assign Prisma base to global for Prisma. But the Prisma client that we want to export from this file is the extended one. So below we write export const Prisma. Then we take our Prisma base and call this dollar sign extends function on there, with which we can create a client extension. In here we have this query key with which we can hook into the query operations. So colon, curly braces, we want to hook into the queries of the card. So card, colon, curly braces. And in here, we want to make a change to the update query. Because update is what we use in all our server actions when we make changes to the card items. And this argument here should be an async function. So we write async update parentheses curly braces and in here we can destructure arguments and auto completion should help us we need the args 
and the query. The args contain the actual body of the update, so the data that we are passing. And to this we want to add the updated else timestamp. So in here we can make changes to args.data. Then we assign this to a JavaScript object. In here we spread the existing args.data to keep all the update operations in here. Comma and additionally we also want to update the updated as timestamp. And we want to set this to a newer date, which gives us the current timestamp. And then below we have to return the query to which we pass these updated arcs. Okay, and this is how we create a Prisma client extension. Let's format this, let's save it, and then our route handler here complains. That's our next off route handler. It doesn't recognize our extended client as a Prisma client anymore. They will probably fix this typing in the future. Again, this is a very new feature, but we can get around this by casting this to a Prisma client from at Prisma slash client like this. This way we tell TypeScript relax, this is a normal Prisma client. Again, in the future, it might not be necessary to use a client extension if they add an option to automatically update the updated add timestamp, even if we don't make a change to the card document itself. But right now we have to go this detour. So let's try this out. In our database, we have this one card, right? The updated add timestamp is currently still the same as the created add timestamp because we haven't changed anything in this document. Even though we added and we updated card items, the updated add timestamp still has the default value. But now with our new changes, when I make an update to the card, this updated add timestamp should change. So I change the quantity of an item, for example. Let's update this. And you can see the new timestamp. Let's try it one more time. Maybe let's add a new item, a clone trooper. And again, right now this is 65018. And after refreshing this, this updates to the current time. So now what you can do is you can set up a cron job. So a task that runs after a certain time interval regularly. For this you can use Vercel cron jobs because we will deploy this project to Vercel. And this way you can execute a route handler, so a server endpoint from time to time, which then checks all your anonymous cards. It checks when they were last updated. And if they haven't been updated for a while, it deletes the card and the card items that belong to this card. And the cards that have a user ID belong to a user, so you usually don't want to delete them at all because they are tied to a user account. We won't implement this in this tutorial. You can figure this out yourself. You can also keep the abandoned card items in the database if you want. I just wanted to show you how you can update the updated add timestamp so that you know which cards to delete. Okay, now it's time to deploy our project to production so that we can actually open our website over the internet. And as usual, the easiest way to deploy a Next.js project is via Vercel, which is a hosting provider and also the company that created and maintains Next.js. So as you can imagine, Vercel is really optimized to deploy a Next.js project and all these features like server components and server actions will just work. To deploy our project, we first have to push it to GitHub. You can do this right in VS Code over the source control tab. Here you want to push your project to a GitHub repository. This repository can be private, doesn't have to be public. And then you want to sign up on Vercel and connect it to your GitHub account. Because then we can just click on add new and add a new project. And this shows us all our projects on our GitHub account. Right now I'm logged into coding and flow. And here I can just click on import and add the Next.js e-commerce project. However, before we deploy this, we have to make a few more preparations. First of all, we go back into our project and open the package.json. Here we have to add a post install script. This is described in the Prisma documentation. Otherwise, if we try to deploy this project on Vercel, we will get an error. This is explained here. It happens because of the way Vercel caches the Prisma client. We have to add this post install script here. 
in our package.json. So this goes into the scripts block like this. Then we want to push this change to our main branch. So add Prisma post install script. Commit and push. Then we also go into our Atlas backend, go to the network access tab, where right now we only allow connections from our local host, right? So we click on add IP address. And in order to be able to connect from Brazil, we have to allow access from anywhere, which adds this zero IP address. Because Brazil uses serverless functions, we don't have our own server machine with a single IP address. Instead, this IP address can change, so we have to allow access from anywhere, but our database is still protected by the password. So this doesn't mean anyone can make changes to our database. We still need the correct password. So we confirm this. Then let's go back to Brazil and import our project here. So we click on import. It automatically recognizes that this is a Next.js project. We don't have to change any build and output settings, but we need to add our environment variables. So in here we put the same env variables that we have in our .env file. The database URL, which is the same as here. Then we click on add and then we can add another one. Google client idea, add client secret, we don't have a next of URL yet because we don't know our URL in advance. Vazel actually gives us a freer URL under .vazel.app, but I don't know this one in advance. So I'm gonna add a placeholder here, http colon slash slash, and I'm just gonna write placeholder.com. I think this will work. We will later replace this for the actual URL we get from Vazel. And the next of the secret, which again is just any random combination of characters. So I just type in a new one here, click on add, and then we click on deploy and hope that this works. This will take a minute or so. That's me in the corner. That's me in the spot. Light. Oh, and it worked. Nice. Congratulations. You just deployed a new project to Brazil and we even get confetti. Okay, let's click on continue to dashboard. And then we get different domains for free. And we have a separate domain for each commit, basically. That's this one here. We have a domain for this main branch. And then we have this domain here, which basically just references the project. So as you can see, it has the project name, Next.js e-commerce recording coding and flow dot app. Let's open this one here because this one will stay the same even if we deploy more changes. We copy this URL because we still have to add it as the redirect URL to our Google Cloud project. So let's edit our OAuth client and add this new redirect URL with our Vazel domain and then the same endpoint here after the slash because this is what next off requires. We save this. And now we should be able to log in on our Vazel domain as well. So let's see if this works. We are still locked out right now. Let's see if we can add an item to the cart. This seems to work. Let me close the website and open it again and see if the card is still intact. Refresh the page. This seems to work. Let's take a look into our database where we should find a new card without a user ID. That's this one here. And we should have the same card ID in our cookie. So let's check the application tab. And here is the local card ID that ends with 597. So this works just like in development. Let's see if we can log into our Google account. Let 
Yeah, and it works. And it merged this new clone trooper into our shopping cart. And whenever you make a change to your project, you only have to push these changes to the main branch and they will automatically be deployed by the cell. You don't even have to click anything. Every change that you push to the main branch will automatically be deployed and then a minute later it will be available on your website. Let's also check if the social media preview works. For this we can use this socialsharepreview.com website and here we can add our domain and then see if we see our open graph image. So Flomazon, we make your wallet cry and there's our OG image. As I explained, this is this open graph image in our app folder. I added this to the starting project, but for a single product page on slash products slash idea, we use the product image as the OG image. So let's see if this works as well. So I go to a single product, I copy this URL, and then we should see our clone trooper instead. Clone trooper, Flomazon, and the description of the product. And this is what you will see if you post a link to our website on Facebook, Twitter, or any of these social media websites. Really cool. Congratulations, you built your own e-commerce website and deployed it to production. Now you could buy a domain, for example, a real domain, connect it to your project and then put Amazon out of business. If this tutorial was any helpful, please do me a favor and leave a like on this video. This shows me that there is more interest in tutorials like this. And also leave a comment what kind of project tutorials you want to see in the future. And lastly, I would be happy if you follow me on Twitter because there I release regular little coding tips that I figure out while I'm preparing these projects. My Twitter handle is codinginflow. And then I wish you a nice rest of the day. Happy coding. Take care.